What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I am here with somebody I think you guys are going to find deeply fascinating, Donald Hoffman. Um, Donald, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks really? for inviting me. Of course, man. Dude, after, so I did an interview with Annika Harris. She introduced me to some of the concepts that we'll be talking about today, which are uh, one crazier than the next, but super interesting. But before we dive into that, give people a super quick synopsis of who you are, your background, all that good stuff. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of California at Irvine in the Cognitive Science Department. I've been there since 1983, and uh, so I study visual perception, um, perception of objects and their, their colors and their shapes and their motions. And then for the last uh, 20, 30 years, I've been studying consciousness as, as well and trying to develop a mathematical model of consciousness and then studying evolution and asking, does evolution shape our senses to see reality as it is or not? So those are sort of the big topics I've been studying. Yes. <clears throat> It, a lot of this seems to go back to vision mm -hmm. and the way that we literally see things. And by the way, don't, th and I don't know how much you know about me or my obsessions, but I'm obsessed with the movie, The Matrix. Yes. And in your dedication, you, I forget the names of the three people, but you said, I offer you the red pill, That's right. uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. So what in your world, what is the red pill? What is the red pill waking us up to? Right. Most of us believe that we see reality as it is. When we look up and see the moon, it's because there really is a moon and it would exist even if there were no observers to see the moon, it would still exist. And we don't believe that we see all of reality. No one thinks that we see everything that there is to see, but we do believe that we've been shaped by natural selection to see those aspects of the truth that we need to see to stay alive. And so that our perceptions of space and time are giving us a genuine insight into a real space and time that would be there even if there were no observers to perceive it. <clears throat> and also our perception of objects like tables and chairs, the moon, quarks and leptons and so forth, that these things would also exist and have roughly the properties that we see even if there were no creatures, no observers to see them at all. And the red pill that I'm offering is to say that <clears throat> if you believe evolution by natural selection, then the mathematics of natural selection makes it very, very clear that the probability is zero that any of the language that we use in our perceptions, the language of space and time, the language of shapes and objects and position and momentum and colors and so forth, is the wrong language to describe objective reality, whatever that reality might be. It's not that we're getting the shape of this table a little bit wrong or the colors a little bit off. It's that no description in the language of space and time and objects and colors could ever be be true reality whatever it is can't be described in that language if we buy evolution by natural selection so we have a choice between taking one of our best confirmed scientific theories seriously namely evolution by natural selection or taking our intuitions that space time is fundamental and objects are fundamental taking that intuition seriously and i decide to to side with this science on this one. <clears throat> All right, so this, a lot of this stuff is gonna be really difficult to tease out, but I think we have to sort of break it into points. And I don't wanna spend our whole time um, describing the theory. We may get lost for a fair amount of time in that. Right. But I, what I hope we can do is sort of lay out the thinking and then get into some of the implications, why it matters and all that good stuff. Sure. Um, so if, I guess let's back up. So. Sure. Tell me how natural selection gives us the mathematical model that invalidates all that. That's probably the right place to start. Right. Most of us think of natural selection and evolution as a biological theory that, that's, that's sort of intuitive, right? You know, if you are better adapted to the environment, you're more likely to pass on your genes and so forth. And, but it, it turns out that in the 1970s, uh, a brilliant guy named John Maynard Smith was able to use the ideas of evolution by natural selection and the tools of mathematics in specific particular uh, game theory 
to create a new field, evolutionary game can theory. You, can you explain game theory? So right. the, when I was diving into your world, when I was reading the right. book, when you talk about miracles, and I don't want to do this out of order, but you talk about like every theory has sort of a base assumption. Right. And it's like, we can't, rah, we can't explain that one, so just please accept that this is right. the, the miracle, as you call it, and then from here, the rest of my argument is going to make sense. Right. Because I don't understand the math well enough. Right. The math, every time you mention this, and nobody pushes you on it, mm -hmm. I don't understand the math well enough. It feels like the miracle to me, but it mm. isn't to you. So what actually, what is the math, if we can sort of mm -hmm. say it at a, at a lay person's right. level, what is the math? How does it show mm -hmm. that there's a zero probability that we're describing reality as it actually exists? Right. So, so the intuition behind using game theory for evolution is very much like if you play a video game, right? If you're playing a video game, you have to focus on getting points as fast as you can. If you get enough in a short enough time, you get to the next level. Otherwise, you die. And an evolution is very much like that. There's points, they're called fitness payoffs, and you have to gather them as quickly as you can. And if you get enough, roughly, in a short enough period of time, you don't go to the next level, but your genes in your children go mm -hmm. to the next level. And so it's, that's roughly why we want to think about game theoretic kinds of things. But it's, of course, it's more detailed than what and I And game just theory <laughs> is literally that, what survives to the next round? Yeah, so game theory is literally a mathematical theory of strategies in games and how different strategies may be better or worse in certain circumstances. So, for example, if, if you, if one game that our species plays is a social cooperation game. Mm -hmm. And when we were hunter-gatherers, if we all went out and cooperated, I went out and hunted wildebeests, and you went out and hunted wildebeests, and others gathered berries and so forth, we all worked hard and came back at the end of the day. If I didn't get enough and you got more, then you might share with me. And tomorrow I might share with you. So that's cooperation. But, and so that works very, very well. That's, that's a strategy that works how, very well. How would we define this game? So I was tempted to say, okay, so it's about the people who have the strategy to win this game called life. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure that's actually how you'd define it. Would, would it be the game called procreation? Right. Or, right. Okay. So in evolution, fitness is all, all about procreation. In fact, basically that's how it's defined. It, it, it's almost... Um, it almost sounds like it's a, a tautology that fitness, being more fit means that you're having more offspring. So whatever you do that lets you have more offspring is by definition giving you greater fitness. Hmm. And so, so in the case of cooperation, I mean, that's not the only strategy by which a species could be successful at having offspring in the next generation. But for Homo sapiens, that was a strategy that we did use, and in many social species do that, ants and bees and so forth. But, but as soon as you have that strategy of cooperation, then it turns out there's another strategy that could be very fit, and that's cheating. So I could pretend, I'm, I'm a loafer now, I don't want to go out there and put my life on the line in front of a wildebeest, and so I just go down to the river, I hide out and relax and take it easy and come back and go, oh, I worked really hard today. I couldn't find anything. Could I share some of yours? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so it turns out that that strategy is very, very fit in the sense that I didn't put my life on the line. If you're willing to share with me, I'm going to survive. So I'm going to have, so that strategy will af actually proliferate. I'll have kids, I'll have more loafers. And so, but it turns out if you, if you have too many loafers, too many cheaters, then no one's bringing home the bacon mm. and the whole thing collapses. And so you get the idea that the, 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 the fitness of a strategy depends on the other strategies that are around. If everybody else is cooperating, then being a cheater is very, very effective. It's a, it's a fit strategy. If everybody's a cheater, then it's not fit to be a cheater because everybody's going to die. And so that's what we call frequency dependent selection, that the frequency of a different of a strategy um, will affect its fitness. And so that makes it more complicated. And that's why we have to do mathematics. It's, you can actually, with mathematical precision, predict exactly what proportion of the population will be cheaters and what proportion will be cooperators once you know certain things about the strategies and, and their payoffs. And so it's, that's why we use evolutionary game theory. It allows us to go away from just intuitive notions of evolution and selection and so forth to precise definitions of strategies, of their fitness, how they interact, when, ha when three or four or four, five or n strategies interact, what happens? It gets very, very complicated. Then our intuitions just give up, mm -hmm. but the math can still carry on where our intuitions give up. Okay, so you partner with a mathematician, and did mm -hmm. you have a theory that you wanted to see if he could 
write mm -hmm. the the sort of algorithm for or how did that right. work how did we end up focusing on math right so in about 2008 i decided i really wanted to go after this because I, I had a suspicion that evolution would not favor creatures that see reality as it is i figured that it would be too complicated and take too much time and it turned out that was correct but but it was more interesting so i got a couple of my graduate students working on this i worked with them we learned evolutionary game theory and we started they, they wrote simulations and so we just simulated creatures with different strategies and we let them see all of the reality or none of the reality we let them just see fitness payoffs give, give me some of the data points so one of them is going to be fitness payoffs right when you're writing in math right. um mm -hmm. uh, like are you making this from a human perspective are you taking this from an ant's perspective i've got to imagine the math looks differently depending right. on the species strategy that's already right. evolved sort of over evolutionary time right. so right. oh god i can only imagine how complicated this is but right. give me a give me a couple of the variables so that right. this stops being one of the miracles for me and i can really start to sure. understand Stand. Sure. So one kind of game that we had them play was a foraging game. So you could think a big a big checkerboard or a big chessboard. And you them. had them play. What do you mean them? The so so my graduate students then had these simulated creatures, and we just plopped them down at random in this big huge checkerboard. Okay. And we had also planted resources around on the checkerboard. And did you have to give them incentives? Well, in in some cases we would just. We would either allow them to evolve incentives, so that was what we called a genetic algorithm. So we started off and they were all stupid. They, oops, they all um, had random genes for how they moved and how they would try to feed and how they would perceive. But there had to be some sense of score, right? So if we're using right, right. game theory, there has to be some sense right. of you have an objective, that objective is to right, right. gobble the resources right, or right. whatever. Yeah, so certain resources that were just randomly distributed on the checkerboard gave you high fitness payoffs, some gave you low fitness okay. payoffs, and, and so forth. So we just placed those So it's those just up. defined as fitness payoff without right. anything right. beyond that. So exactly. Just they, like had, they had a, a, a driver, if you will, to put it in human terms, they had a drive to acquire fitness payoffs. Right, right. Got it. Um, at least in, when, we, when we programmed them. Now, when we just had the genetic algorithm, there was no drive at all. The, they they just what had, would make them move? So they they had to do something, but the genes were random. So they they would do stupid stuff, like they would stay in one spot and try to eat, and and they would get nothing, and they just keep trying to eat there the whole time until that whole session, and, and they would just die out. Right. So in the first generation, right, the, we did they have the desire to eat and procreate? Like, were they looking to mate, or how did you? All the only the only desire was we we told them they had to do something every step of the game. That's all. We and was do there something. a list of items for them to choose from? Eat, move. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Eat and move. And that was pretty much it. And, and step. Yeah, eat and move. That's right. And then you had something on the back end that said if they score this many number of points, then they essentially procreate that's and they right. move on to the next generation. That's if right. they don't, they're dead. That's exactly okay. right. Okay, got it. So the first generation, pr pretty much all of them just acted very stupidly. They didn't get any fitness points or very, very few. Mm. Some bumped against walls and just kept bumping into the walls. And so we would just breed the ones that were a little bit less stupid than the rest and then make a new generation of them. And we did that for four or 500 generations. And then by the time we'd done that 500 generations, we had creatures that looked very purposeful. They were foraging in an almost optimal pat pattern. They weren't wasting any time and they were getting high fitness payoffs. And we could look at their perceptions. And we found that they evolved perceptions that didn't show them the truth. It showed them only fitness payoffs, which was no surprise to me, but, but what was a surprise was the reason why. It wasn't just that it was too expensive to, to see the truth. It was that seeing the truth and seeing what you need to survive are very very different things and and so so i went to a mathematician once, once i had the simulations and i realized that this looked like it was a real result and then i gotten some new ideas about what was really going on so the simulations really taught me it wasn't just that it was too time and and resource expensive to see the truth it was that in some sense the truth is completely irrelevant that, that it's, and, and also that the fitness payoffs themselves don't tell you anything about the truth. They're, they're just independent. Mm -hmm. So I went and, and worked with a mathematician named Chaitan Prakash, and um, 
we've worked together. He's the mathematician. I'm, I'm not. And we have, and I've gotten some other collaborators as well, some very, very good collaborators. And we have a couple papers that we've now written where with two different angles on, on the theorem. And the bottom line is, is this. Um, it's, it's straightforward to prove that, well, straightforward if you have a mathematician working with you. <clears throat> um, but to prove that the, an organism that sees reality as it is, in whole or in part, is never more fit than an organism of equal complexity that sees none of reality, whose senses actually don't have the right language to see reality, and is just instead tuned to the fitness payoffs. Okay, so <laughs> this is the, sort of the first thing that I trip over. So um, I get where I could see that it is more advantageous to be optimized for fitness payoffs than it is for reality. Right. And this might be a good time to give people your sort of VR explanation so right, that we, right, right. we can bring this into something they can visualize. But first, let me right. finish what I'm bumping on. So sure, sure. I get how if you're optimized for fitness payoffs, that makes more sense than being optimized for reality. Reality could have too much just complexity. The processing power that it would take to understand is crazy, right. which is exactly why I think your desktop analogy is probably the, the better one to hit right, right. now. Sure. Um, but what I don't understand is why it is necessarily true <clears throat> that you need to hide reality. Right. Like why right. that would be part of it. That seems right. Right. sort of a bridge too far for my, my simplistic mind. So that is a bit technical, but, I, but the top level idea is um, that fitness payoffs depend on the state of the world, right? So to be concrete. And the organism, and right? And the organism, right. They depend on the world and the organism and the state of the organism and the action. So, I mean, one example is, you know, if, if I have a T-bone steak and, you know, the fitness payoff of that T-bone steak for a hungry lion is pretty high. <laughs> but for the same lion that wants to mate, it's very, very low. And for, you know, a cow in any state and for any action, the T-bone steak offers no fitness payoffs. And, and it, another example is if I'm 5,000 meters underwater, that's pretty bad for me. But for a benthic <laughs> fish... That's it's perfect for a benthic fish, right? So, so evolution by natural selection has this idea that there is an objective reality, and fitness payoffs do depend on that reality. But the payoff for the same state of reality could be very, very different for a benthic fish than for me. For a benthic fish, 5,000 meters underwater is the same state of reality as it would be for me, but the payoff is very, very different for the benthic fish than okay, for me. So it would kill me. This, this may not be the thing to dive into, but I, I'm gonna push on this a little sure. bit and see if we get somewhere fruitful. Um, what, where I sort of come to in your theory mm -hmm. is that they're lurking under this. Mm -hmm. It is a reality, right? The right. moon is there to describe something. It's my shorthand. It's not, it right. is not a meaningless shorthand. Right. It is a shorthand to help me get my, um, my fitness payoffs, right. fair. Right. But it, it represents something. Okay, so if that is true, right. understanding that I am 5,000 feet underwater still seems relevant, even though it's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a fitness payoff. So obscuring that or obfuscating that for me so that I can't understand mm -hmm. that I'm 5,000 feet underwater is not helpful. Okay, right, right. I can tell that if we chase that, we, we won't get where we wanna go. But if you it, give us the desktop analogy, right, right. because <clears> this <throat> I think will, will give us the anchor that we need to keep right, exploring. Right. So, so if evolution didn't shape us to see the truth, what did it shape us to see? Mm. And the, I think the, the good analogy is that it gave us like a desktop interface. So if you're um, writing an email and the icon for the email you're writing is blue and rectangular in the middle of your screen, does that mean the email in your computer is blue, rectangular, in the middle of the screen? Uh, middle of the computer? Of course not. That, I mean, anybody who thought that misunderstands the point of the interface is there not to show you the truth, which in this metaphor would be the circuits and software, the diodes and resistors, magnetic fields. You don't want to deal with that. If you, if you had to deal with magnetic fields to write an email, good luck. You would never, no one would hear from you. And so that's what evolution did for us. It gave us a desktop interface that's there to hide the truth, right? The desktop interface on your computer is there explicitly to hide the circuits and software. You don't wanna see that stuff. That would, seeing the truth would get in the way. But isn't <clears throat> evolution somewhat of a blind watchmaker? I mean, right. to just steal from, from my man, Mr. Dawkins. Right, right. So if it is blind, it's not hiding anything. Right, so right, it's right. just, it's optimizing you for something. So right. that's where I get into the, like, 
the the punchline mm -hmm. of your theory, not to get too far ahead, but for people to understand why I'm stopping you. So right, sure. the the punchline of the theory is we are so the far like so far off from what is real right. as to like not even be able to right. To conceive of what our world really is, and we will mm -hmm. definitely get into space time is doomed. It's one of the most sure. fascinating things to come out of yes. um, your theory, but it's like, I it doesn't feel like a blind watchmaker is going to hide something from me. It it just it it has no sense of it. It's just here is the shortest path across mm -hmm. the checkerboard to get to this thing. It's not trying to trick me into thinking that there is no checkerboard. It's just like it eh, take this path, go that way. It's the shortest path. Mm -hmm. I'm essentially lazy, right? If you think about um, caloric realities, right? right. So uh, the way that I look at a, a human, um, I, I want to write a book called The Physics of Being Human. Hmm. And to do that, I would really, it's the, like you write the book that you need. Right. So right. to understand in myself why I am both driven and lazy is so fucking weird. So yes. I both have these huge ambitions. And I want to do this crazy shit, but I also want to sit on the couch and eat chips. Right. So it's like, and they're both real, man. I am mm -hmm. not like, right. when people think that like, oh, I'm being humble or whatever. No, no, no. I really have like a hardcore drive to sit around and do nothing. Mm -hmm. But I have this like sort of weird bouncing thing. So for me to understand it from a, a caloric utilization standpoint, right. Right. as humans, we have these massive brains that are calorically just ravenous. Mm -hmm. And so for me not to have to forage all the time, right. I take a strategy where I'm conserving calories. Again, blind mm -hmm. watchmaker, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not right. somebody going, hey, sure. you know, it'd be really smart. Right. It just realized the ones that didn't conserve calories fucking died and you know, they didn't survive a famine or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the ones that sort of balance this, like I'm going to go down and I'm going to face the wildebeest and I'm not going to hide all the time. Right, right. You know, I'm going to put myself at risk and, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. the, the ones that found that balance, they were the ones that procreate and they pass on their genes. Right. Okay. So right. part of the physics of being human is to both mm -hmm. be adventurous right. and lazy at right. the same time. Mm -hmm. Where, where I'm trying to like figure all this out then is, okay, I have this layer, I have my interface, but it doesn't feel like it's that like radically far from mm -hmm. the, the truth. Right, so I'll, right. I'll give you my example. Right. So, mm -hmm. all right, it's mapping this room. You're going to tell me, fuck, dude, you don't even understand. Like space time isn't real. None of this shit is real. Right, right. I look away. The moon doesn't even exist. Right, right. That seems like it would be more problematic for me to navigate the world if all of that were true. So what I want to understand mm -hmm. is how much of, of what you say about the computer interface is really that divorced from reality. Right. Oh man, stick with me. I'm going to see if I can actually articulate this. Right, right. So mm -hmm. the, the computer analogy right. is super profound. It's easy for me to understand. I don't want to have to deal with the electrical fields right. and all the other things, the diodes or whatever, all that mm -hmm. stuff. But when I think about whacking into a rock that seems right. like a way closer thing to my reality. I've mapped something over that. Mm -hmm. Same with the moon. I've mapped something over it. It isn't mm -hmm. actually that thing. Right. But it feels like it would be mapping over some mm -hmm. gravitational object that rotates around the earth. Mm -hmm. But I think you're going to say that's not true. Right. So one analogy, because it, it, our intuitions rebel at the idea that we're not seeing the truth because it's what we're doing here works so well, right? And, and I'm open to that we're not seeing the truth. Where, where I get lost is how fucking divorced can it really be and still right, right. be useful? Right. Well, so there's two aspects to that. One, one is just that, you know, the mathematics of evolution is quite clear. We, Meaning we, the probability that you see the truth is zero. Is zero. That's right. And, and that, we have a paper that we just submitted on Monday um, where we, we show that the fitness payoffs erase all evidence of world structure almost surely. With what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> when means, you say world structure, what do you mean? So the world, presumably there is some world, some reality. Yes, right? like it, atoms? Uh, well, you don't need to postulate exactly what that I world is. I need to is. know what you mean by the, wor the word structure. So it could be, and what we show is it doesn't matter what the structure is, pretty much the result holds. So it could be, for example, a structure like uh, a distance relationship, a what we call a metric, or yes. a topology or a measurable structure okay or a total order like one is uh, smaller than two is smaller than three that that's a total order right uh -huh. so whatever the so what, what you can show is that no matter what structure you might think the world has you can prove that the fitness payoff functions that govern our 
evolution. So you're right, there's no, of course, goal, right? It's not a goal-directed kind of thing. Right. It, you know, evolution not trying to do anything. And, but the point is that the fitness payoffs which govern evolution, the probability that they will actually preserve the structure in the world so that by being tuned to the fitness, you're tuned to the structure in the world, Yeah. that probability is precisely zero. That's what we prove. So the only thing that we know is what you think is real is the only thing we know is not real. Is well, that accurate? Well, I would say according to theory of evolution. Now we can step uh, back and ask ourselves what the theory of you know what we think about the theory of evolution, yeah. right? But well, I'm before that, we get to that, because yeah, right. you you do you, you have a pretty deft challenge to how because my first literally the first note I took about you was my whole problem is you're laying out hey evolution mathematically proves that essentially evolution isn't true. So oh, I was right, like, right. Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> like right, right, if right. if everything I think evolution is true. How can it also be true that everything I know and think is false, right? right? Which is essentially what I just heard you say. So mathematically, I can prove this, the quote unquote structure of everything I think is absolutely not true. And yet I'm using evolution to right. base that math on. Right. So Walk people through how that isn't a contradiction. Right. So it's, it's what we show is that the fitness payoff functions erase any information about the structure of the world so that the structure of our perceptions is just unrelated to the structure in the objective world. But the argument that I just gave does not apply to our math and logic. So, so just perception. Just perceptions. So you have to be very, very, we have to look at all of our cognitive capacities is one at a time. Is this whole thing an Umwelt problem? Well, it, what it's saying is that uh, your Umwelt is like your user interface, that every creature you know, Homo sapiens has one umwelt, one user interface. We have the Apple interface, and someone else, you know, some other creatures have the Mac you know, or the PC interface or, or, or whatever. Yep. And, and, and there's going to be a wide variety of interfaces that evolution evolves. Every species has its own class of interfaces. Um, and in each case, the interface never shows any species the truth at all, according to evolution. But there are selection, the selection pressures that erase information about the structure of the world in perception do not also apply to math and logic. The reason is that we do have to have some elementary ability to reason about fitness payoffs. Two bites of an apple give me roughly twice the fitness payoffs of one. So not reasoning about objective reality, just reasoning about fitness payoffs and the logic of fitness payoffs, right? So. That's why I, there's no selection pressures necessarily to be geniuses of math and logic, but at least the selection pressures are not uniformly against any capacity in math and logic. Whereas in the case of perception, it's, one can show the, the pressures are uniformly against any access to the structure of the world um, in, in terms of the structure of what we perceive in, in our senses. So that's why we have to be very, very careful. So certain, for example, Christian philosophers, uh, Alvin Plantinga, for example, has argued from, uh, not mathematically, but informally from evolution, saying that it, it would make all of our cognitive capacities unreliable, and therefore evolution by itself was unreliable theory, and therefore we should not, you know, not believe it. And I'm not saying anything like that at all. I'm saying that the theory of evolution has a core that John Maynard Smith found, evolutionary game theory. When we look at that core, we find that there are certain peripheral assumptions, like DNA exists whether or not it's perceived. Space and time exist. Those peripheral assumptions turn out to contradict the mathematical core of the theory, and, it's, and one can prove that. But math and logic, our ability with math and logic, does not contradict the evolutionary, you know, the core of evolutionary theory. So this, we have to be very, very careful. That's why you know, when you, you do this, you know, it's, it's not just hand wave anymore. You really have to look at the replicator equation. You really have to look at the fitness payoff functions and do combinatorial analyses and so forth. This is very, very careful work. But that's what we do with our best scientific theories. We take them very, very seriously. We look at their equations and say, okay, if the equation entails the probability zero that we see reality as it is, then We've, we've got a choice. We can agree that we don't see reality as it is, or we can say we need to revise the theory. Now, we don't have an alternative to evolution by natural selection. So if someone wants to propose one, they've got a lot of work to do because evolution by natural selection is an incredibly successful theory. So is space-time, though, 
and you're yeah. you're ready to ditch that one. Sure. Yeah. So um, okay, so I'm I'm getting I think what you're saying about per, our umwelt, and because uh, we haven't defined that, I'll define that. So. Uh, umwelt is your senses take in the world in a certain way, mm -hmm. and uh, we have different senses than a bat. So a bat can do echolocation, we cannot, and therefore the way that a bat interprets the world is very right. different than the way that we interpret the world. And every sort of species has a different umwelt. You can even have humans that have a, diff a slightly different umwelt, one that's colorblind. Um, there's a million other right. examples, but you you get these variations that are massive between species. Um, you get like a dog, the the amount that they can smell is crazy. They can smell a seizure coming, which is absolutely right, right, bananas, right, right. whereas, right. of course, you're not going to get a human that does that because of the number of um, scent receptors in the nasal canal. And so, cool. All right. that That's an umwelt. So I get perception. I get that this is a, a problem of perception. I think I understand the math part. I probably because I'm going to I am making a layman's assumption that math is a universal language. I've heard that repeated a million times. I am so mm -hmm. bad at math. I don't even understand that, mm -hmm. uh, but I accept it out of ignorance. Uh, the logic part. Let me define logic based on what I think you're saying. Mm -hmm. And you tell me if I'm getting it correct. So logic, the way that I understand it from the way that you just use it, because I would have said it's human reasoning. So I would have gotten tripped up um, on like natural selection or, oh God, the one you just used it as an example. And you said that that we think, space time, a great example, right? We have, in my layman's view, we have logic our way to space time, mm -hmm. but that's failed me. So um Tying it back to fitness payoffs, I think, mm -hmm. is, is your definition of logic, that we have to be able to reason that one bite of an apple is not as good as two right. bites of an apple. It's, right. Is it really that basic? That it's, it is entirely tied to fitness payoffs. That's, well, from, an, from the evolutionary arguments that I'm giving, right? So the arguments that, that... But do you think that logic reaches deeper than that when you say that it's untouched by this um, false... Interpretation, oh God, I'm putting words right. in your mouth. Well, right, so, okay. so that gets to the bigger picture of what I'm up to here, right? So, and this is how science progresses. What we do um, is we take our current best theories and we try to push them to their limits and find out where they break, mm. where they fall apart. And when we do that, that's when we break out the champagne because the whole point in science is to push our best theories to the limit to find out where they break down and then get some clue about a deeper theoretical framework. And the constraint on that deeper theoretical framework is it better agree with our current theory where our current theory is right. But it, only if you're saying that that theory is logic. This is another one of those times where I bumped against what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this may be that simple. Is that what you mean? That like where we are using true logic, right. as you define it, tied to fitness payoffs, I think, um, then it must agree. Because you've said if you work backwards, okay. I'm not trying to get rid of evolution. I'm not trying to get rid of the things that we know. Like we can launch a satellite into space and right. geo-target you, but that requires relativity. So whatever we um, get to, whatever answer we come to, better be backwards compatible with the ideas that essentially work. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a definition though of work and is it tied to right. logic as you define right. Right. it and thusly fitness payoffs? Right, so, so the idea would be that scientists are doing reasoning, right? Science is about reasoning. Is reasoning a synonym for logic to you? Pretty much, okay. that's right. And if we, um, we can't, logic is in some sense non-negotiable in the sense that if I let go of reason and logic, then there's nothing left, right? Is that true? R because all we can do, is if, we, if we're having a conversation, mm -hmm. we can talk informally, but we can't make very good progress unless we are absolutely precise in what we say. I and agree with and that, but let me tell you how that struck me. So does mm -hmm. somebody who's schizophrenic, do they have reason and logic? Well, in the sense that if we're trying to understand our situation in the universe, humans will make stories. Yes. If the stories are internally self-contradicting, you can be pretty sure you're going to be in trouble, 
right? So any internal contradictions are going to destroy your theory. So the first thing you have to do is make sure that what you're saying doesn't contradict what you're saying. If you, it, because that just means you're saying nonsense. So one, one reason we, we use math and logic is to make sure that what we're saying isn't just flat out nonsense. But once we're past that criterion, and, and much of what we've said is nonsense, but once we get past that criterion, then it turns out we may have been using our terms very imprecisely. We might use the word space, we might use the word time, and we think we know what we're talking about, but when you actually push, you find out, oh no, I, I would say this in this situation, that in that situation, oh, and they contradict. I've contradicted myself again. So once again, we find that if we're, we just use intuitive concepts, we get trapped in self-contradiction, namely nonsense. So the whole point of being mathematically precise, one point, is to make sure that we're not doing nonsense. The second is to take our ideas and force us to put our ideas very, very precisely so we know exactly what we're saying. I get the math part, though. The part that I'm really trying to wrap my head around, and maybe we should just move the fuck off this, but I'll okay, take right, one right. more swing at sure, it. Sure. Um, math I get. Hmm? If, if math truly is a universal language that just sort of gets at the substrate of what this, whatever this is, right. it actually gets to that, cool. I can right. see how um, the fact that we, that uh, chasing fitness payoffs manipulates our umwelt, I get that it doesn't touch math. Cool. Right. Now what I'm trying to understand right. is okay. you said specifically math and logic. Now, right. if you right. just said math, we'd be done and we'd move on. Right. But right. you say math and logic. So then I immediately mm -hmm. go to right. schizophrenics think they're being logical. Right. What on earth makes us think that we are not just the way that our, our um, reality is essentially this total abstraction, right, in your own theory? And, and I would agree, man. I, I routinely think in myself and and express other people, your brain is creating a virtual reality. Now, I never, ever, ever th conceived of it as sort of radically different mm -hmm. as you, mm -hmm. but um, I get that we're in okay. sort of this, this huge abstraction. But what makes us think that, that our, the way that we reason, the way that we logic outside of math, right. Sure. Right. the way that we reason and logic outside of math isn't the same as a schizophrenic, where it is, it right. is right. so delusional. Is right. it right. just the internal consistency or, right. And couldn't that itself be a delusion that our fear of right. internal right. Um, contradiction is gotcha. problematic, is, is actually a delusion in and of itself? Oh, very, very good. So I see your question now. So yes, there are deep issues here in terms of, of logic. And there is something called Gödel's incompleteness theorem that basically... Give it to me. Are you familiar yeah, with that? No, oh, not oh, at all. So, so Gödel is probably arguably one of the most profound results ever in human thought. Gödel proved... It's called Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and he proved that any axiomatic logical or mathematical system that's rich enough to do arithmetic, um, there will be statements that are true but can't be proven within that system. Unprovable truths. The notion of truth goes deeper than the notion of proof in that system. You might say, well, okay, I'll take that truth and put it into my axioms. Then he said, well, but then there'll be new truths that you can't prove, and this goes on forever. What he showed was that the exploration of mathematical structure is in principle endless. It's unbounded. And in fact, if we get, get to it later on, my theory of consciousness, I'll argue that that's what consciousness is up to, this unbounded exploration of all the possibilities of, of consciousness that comes from Gödel's theorem. But you're, you're absolutely right, we can choose Give me Gödel's theorem one more time. Right, right. right. As so, simply as you can. Right. The, the simple bottom line is there is no end to the exploration of mathematical structure. It's turtles all the way down. All the way. And in principle, you can never know it all. Who? okay, interesting. It's and definitely. I definitely get how this ties into your theory of consciousness. So let's spend a minute on turtles all the way down. Uh, super cool story. It, I, I don't remember where this started, so if you do, by all means, jump in. But it, mm -hmm. uh, woman was claiming that the Earth is flat, and so somebody mm -hmm. said, okay, if it's flat, then what is it sitting on? And the <laughs> right. story goes that it's sitting on a giant turtle. And so the person asked her, what is the turtle sitting on? And she said, don't be ridiculous. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and of course, you get into this. Eventually, one of those turtles is on something. Right. So and that's that same human like visceral reaction is how I react to your theory of consciousness. So right. why don't you give it to us? And then we're going to start playing around with the brain. OK. Right. Um, but right. what is your theory of consciousness? Right, so I'm saying that space and time aren't fundamental. 
because evolution by natural selection entails that. Not only not fundamental, but not real, right? That's right. They're, they're only real as forms of our experience. They're our not, umwelt. That's right. They're our umwelt. They're not They're real. part of the virtual reality desktop that's extra right. abstraction. That's right. Okay. But they're not real in the sense of an objective reality, in the sense that they would be there even if no creature were around to perceive it. So... It's again like a virtual reality. Every time, like if you're playing a, a game of uh, you know fast race cars in in virtual reality, I see Can a red I, Corvette. Sorry, yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but uh, would another way to say that be because you say when I look at the moon and then I look away that I you haven't said this in this interview, but I've heard you say it many times that you you trash bin it or something like that. Right. You're no yeah. longer rendering it. Garbage collector. Right? Garbage collector. <laughs> right. um, would another way to say that the moon doesn't exist, quote unquote? if there were no species to perceive it, it's really that there, the moon wouldn't be um, created, essentially. It's like it, it, it is requiring an umwelt of a particular species to create that shorthand right. over evolution to exactly. say whatever that thing is right. that the moon is meant to represent, right. um, it has been created by humans as a moon. Maybe bats see it entirely differently right, and right. fish don't have any sense that it's real <clears throat> at all. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, it's really that we, we evolution maybe is, is a better way to say it, that evolution has created this virtual reality. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if that species ceased to exist, its mm -hmm. version of virtual reality would obviously cease to exist because it's being created. Right, exactly. Oh, uh, but I'm going to say it's being created by the brain. You're going to say the brain's not real. Right, 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 uh, right. Is that true? Right. The brain. Right, okay. Yeah. Right, this right, is where right. the shit gets so complicated. Right, right. Okay. So I'm going to shut up now. Right. Uh, back to your theory of consciousness. Right. So, but I'll just point your your VR thing is is I think a, a good example for anybody who's spent time in VR. What I'm saying will be obvious, right? If you're playing a VR game of like race cars you see a red corvette when you turn your heads up that way you know that you're only seeing a corvette that you're creating when you turn your head that way you turn your head to the other side now you're seeing a blue mustang the red corvette is gone it doesn't exist there's no red corvette in the computer that's running the game the red corvette is only in your mind when you look over there now you're seeing a blue mustang because you're making that and so you you're rendering these things and then destroying them there is a reality but it's not corvettes and it's not mustangs it's the supercomputer that's running the game and that's what I'm, all I'm saying is evolution gave us this headset, and it's no surprise. I see the moon, I render a moon. I turn away, I don't render a moon, so the moon doesn't exist. There is something, but it's just not like, a, it's, it's not the moon, it's nothing like the moon. Just like there's something, there's a supercomputer super in the, the VR analogy, but in the supercomputer, if you looked, you'll never find any you know, green Mustangs or, or red Corvettes. <laughs> you give an example in your book that is so powerful. If you would take a second, sure. you describe <clears throat> what's happening in your eye when you look at a scene that includes a red apple and the way you describe it at the photoreceptor level, I was like, oh my God. It gave me <laughs> such an understanding of how terrifyingly complicated oh, right. things actually are. Do you remember the part sure, that I'm sure. talking about? Mm -hmm. Right. So... This is now just normal physiology. And so for the moment, I'll be talking as though, you know, I believe in brain science and, <laughs> and, 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 neuro, and, and, and we have to do that, as right? As if. <clears throat> I right, love it. Right. So yep. we have to bracket. Everything is within the framework of a theory. So I'm yep. now using neurophysiology and, and physics right now for this, to describe this. So when you look at a red apple, and suppose there really is a red apple just for sake of this argument, it's got a real shape and light rays hit it and they have certain frequencies and they pass through the lens of your eye, which focuses it on the back of your eye, just like a camera would. And on the back of your eye, you've got a piece of brain called the retina. It's, a, it's nervous tissue. So it's a piece of nervous tissue. It has 120 million photoreceptors. It's like a 120 mega, megapixel camera. And each photoreceptor is just reporting how many quanta of light, how many photons it catches. So I caught three, I caught 10, I caught 50. That's all you've got, a bunch of numbers. So you have 120 million numbers. There are no colors, there are no shapes, there are no motions, there's just 120 million colors, uh, numbers, not, not, not even colors. It's like if you look at the, uh, the, the digital output from a video camera, you'll mm -hmm. just see a stream of numbers. If you look at the stream of numbers, you'll see the problem that vision has. You can't tell from the stream of numbers what's going on. You have to create three-dimensional objects and shapes and colors and so forth from all those numbers. And so that's the problem that we have in vision. You have all these photon counts, 120 million photon counts on each eye. And from that, you have to then create objects. See that it's a boy on a bicycle eating a hot dog, you know. 
all of that is you. And that comes, that's not just theory, it becomes really an important problem when you're trying to build computer vision systems, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to build a self-driving car, say, with, with passive vision systems. Well, so the vision systems are cameras, the video cameras, say, they're taking in video. Maybe they have, you know, a few million pixels that they come in that each, each you know, maybe 70 times a second or something like that. Well, those pixels are just numbers. You've got millions and millions of numbers coming in every second. There's nothing in there that says that's a boy, that's a car, don't, you know, that's a stop sign. There's nothing in there that says that. You have to, you have to have megabytes of software that's really intelligent that takes all those numbers and starts computing with them to figure out three-dimensional shapes, to figure out what the objects are, to, and, and to figure out, oh, I'm about to hit a boy, I need to hit the brakes, and so forth. So, so this is not just abstract. Self-driving cars have to solve the problem of starting with numbers that are in, unintelligent in some sense, just a bunch of numbers, and giving you an intelligent assay of what's happening in the world. And so that's why a third of the brain literally a third of the cerebral cortex, the, the higher part of, of our brain, is involved just in visual perception. When you add the other senses, it's, it's more like half the brain is involved in sensory perception because the senses are doing an incredibly complicated job. But from my point of view, what they're doing is they're building a VR world. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of processing power. You need supercomputers, you know, what would have been considered supercomputers to do VR in real time. And that's what we're doing. We open our eyes and it looks like we're just seeing a 3D world with objects and shapes and colors. It seems so real and so just we're seeing the truth but because you have billions of neurons, trillions of synapses that are doing it all within about 100 milliseconds. And so you're so fast at it that you just think you're opening your eyes and seeing the truth. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a VR world that you're projecting out there in real time. Of course, now I'm going to rescind the brain part, right? So the brain itself is part of the space-time interface. So the brain itself is just our VR symbol for something deeper that's doing the real work. And so the question will be, what deeper theory can we come up with, right? So it's gonna be a theory outside of space and, and time. But this gets back to what we have to do in science all the time. We push our current theories to the limits till they break. And then we have to actually take a creative leap. We can't necessarily just use the language of our theories that we just broke. We have to come up with a deeper language, and that is a leap. When Einstein went past Newton, he took a deep leap. Mm. And when quantum mechanics went past Einstein and Newton, it took an even deeper leap, and the language was entirely different. But you can show, for example, that if you start with Einstein, you get back Newton, roughly, as the speed of light goes to infinity. The way Newton talks about space and time and matter, you know, mass, those terms actually mean something different than what they mean in Einstein. In Newton, mass is mass, and you have the same mass, period. Mm. In Einstein, your mass depends on your velocity. Your length depends on your velocity. Distances depend on your velocity. None of that, Space and time and mass don't behave that way at all in Newton. We use the same words, but they mean something very radically different in Einstein. And in quantum mechanics, it's, it's even a deeper leap. But with quantum mechanics, you get back Newton as something called Planck's constant goes to zero. Again, roughly. I mean, this is sure, sure. for first approximation. So, what we, so the leap I need to make here now is evolution by natural selection is telling us that the language of space and time and then objects in space and time, is the wrong language to describe objective reality. So the leap I need to make is to say, is there a deeper theoretical framework that I can come up with? Such that when I look at the dynamics of that deeper framework and project it back into our VR interface, which, I'm, which is space and time. So I've got this VR headset of space and time. That's what evolution has told us. This thing is just a headset You've got to guess, right? I'm not telling you what's outside the headset. I just told you all I can tell you. Mm. It's a headset. Now it's up to you to take a stab at what's behind the headset. So that's what I'm up to. So I'm probably wrong, right? I mean, we weren't evolved. The evolution by itself doesn't say anything that makes me think I'm evolved to see the truth. Mm. But it, it at least is telling me that whatever the truth is out there, you're only seeing a headset. It's good enough to tell us that, but it's not good enough to tell us what's outside. 
That takes a leap outside of the theory of evolution. But the constraint on that theory is we need to show how our deeper theory could lead to me having a headset. And in that headset, it looks like things are evolving according to evolution by natural selection. Mm. In other words, my deeper theory has a strong constraint on it. It better look like Einstein's theory of space-time. It better look like quantum field theory. And it better look like evolution by natural selection, the three big pillars of modern science. If I can't do that, then I know I'm wrong. So Even that, though all of those things exist in the headset. That's right. Okay, this is mm. fucking fascinating. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> now... Tall order. Do you have that idea? I have a proposal. Let's hear it. I'm probably wrong. Can before you give us your proposal, I have I want to acknowledge you, dude. The way that you talk like that, I love so much. I can't remember if it was Plank or Bohr that said, um, anybody this is a terrible paraphrase. Anybody that thinks that science advances because objective truth is presented is absolutely wrong. Science right. advances because the old guard dies right, and right. the new people grow up just believing it to be self evident. Right. I fucking hate that so much. The fact that people are not willing to be wrong right. drives right. me crazy, makes me want to choke half the world out. Right. Right. So the fact that you talk from the perspective of, hey, look, I've got a theory. It's probably wrong. Like, oh, dude, I love that so much. I wish more people were, were as hardcore as you to present. You, you, oh, God, you call it bold and precise? I, I present an, a theory, hypothesis, that's both bold and precise. Right, right. Love that and that you're willing to be wrong. So anyway, I just had to take a second. Every time I hear you say that, I want to stand up and clap. Because so few people are willing to own that they're probably wrong, right, right. but they're not afraid to make a bold and precise prediction. So, right. bravo, And, and, and the, the thing about that is, I just want to understand. And so if I'm stuck in my ideas and won't let go of them, mm. then if I'm wrong, I'm going to not understand. So it's really stupid to think that you're, you have to have enough hope that your ideas have some promise that you pursue them but not be dogmatic about them. That's, that's a, mm. it's a fine balance. Very um, much so. All right, so now our bold and precise claim is? So I'm proposing, and I'll, I'll say what I'm proposing and then I'll say why I went that direction. Okay. So I'm proposing that reality is a vast social network of interacting conscious agents. So that consciousness is fundamental and think of it like the Twitterverse, right? There's mm -hmm. tens of millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets, Lots of stuff trending. It's a, Twitter users are tweeting and following, and, and, and so it's all a big social interaction, right? So I'm proposing, and it, this is a mathematically precise proposal, that there are things called conscious agents. So conscious experiences, like the taste of chocolate, the smell of garlic, are fundamental, and limited choices based on those experiences. That's part of the whole structure. So experiences that inform choices. That's gonna be the fundamental idea mm -hmm. in a vast social network. And the idea then about our headset is, is as follows. If you are a Twitter user and you want to understand deeply what's going on in the Twitterverse, well, you can't engage with all 10 million users and the billion tweets. It's just overwhelming. You, you would die before you could even read all this stuff. Mm. So what do you do? Well, whenever we have big social media data, we have to have visualization tools. Those tools will necessarily ignore most of the data. And the part that they don't ignore, they're going to compress it down. They're going to digest it and compress it into some eye candy that we can understand. Some objects in three dimensions that have nice colors and move in certain ways. And using that visualization tool, I can maybe see what's trending in New York, what's happening in all, you know, so the big scale of Europe, what's happening in little scale in Irvine and so forth. So I'll have a tool that lets me zoom in and out and, and it'll be ignoring most of the stuff. And that's what I'm claiming space time is and mm. physical objects. It's our headset. It's a visualization tool that certain conscious agents use to interact with this vast social network that would otherwise be completely overwhelming. Okay. And so we've made but the rookie mistake. The, finish that, the rookie mistake. Rookie mistake of taking our headset for the final reality. Okay. We have a tool and we thought it was the thing we were visualizing. Amazing. Very clear. Now let's back up and break these down sure. part by part because conscious agent, I'm familiar enough with your work that I kind of know what you mean, but I don't think people understand that like how small you take that down because you're not talking that they're, oh, hey, this is all a bunch of people, which is probably what somebody hearing this for the first time thinks that you think they're invisible people that make up this social network. Right. Um, 
how far like so turtles all the way down boys and girls so we're talking about consciousness all the way down how like are um neutrinos like are they conscious right so no so this is very different from is that because it's in the the headset that's right neutrinos okay. are particles inside space-time okay sorry so, so damn no, it nothing right, inside space-time is i fell for it. rookie mistake uh okay so out outside it uh so do you delineate between uh advanced cognition and consciousness not in principle no interesting right. so do you i'm really trying to get you to use other words so define agent Right. So we're so, conscious. We're this is a collection of conscious agents having a social. Ex, did you say social media specifically? No, you well, did not. Social no, network. Social network. They're okay. like a vast social network. Got mm-hmm. it. Okay. So uh, give me what a conscious agent is. Okay. The simplest example, the most trivial agent that the mathematics allows, is an agent that has only maybe two experiences, maybe like red and green. Okay. That's all it experiences. Why does it have to be two? Well, it could be even just none. You could have an an agent that has none or one, but I I tend to think about what I call a one-bit agent, a sort of fundamental. But I could have an agent that has only one experience, like nothing or red. Has an experience makes me feel like I'm not I'm not interpreting what you say in the same way that you mean it. So you you said something and it went by so fast. Okay, uh, which was the taste of garlic and chocolate are fundamental. If I remember correctly, that's right. Okay, so. Literally, the taste of garlic is a conscious agent? No, it's an experience. Okay. So that thing, it's not like, hey, Bob, you're the taste of garlic. No, no. no, Okay. So sorry to use overly crass language, but that sort of, that was my initial interpretation of what you said. Okay. So that makes sense. So uh, I will then push and say, if that's the case, is this not, would not garlic and um, chocolate be tied to the umwelt of the species? Per- absolutely. So certain agents will But does have, that mean it's in the headset then? Um, well, those experiences... So the headset is created out of your experiences. Uh-huh. You, so what an agent does is uses some of its experiences <laughs> as a format for a headset. But I, Okay, so what I'm trying to get to, and I think this is what you're proposing, mm-hmm. is, hey, we take the headset off and we see... Oh. Like, what do we see? And I get that we have the problem of perception, and that's right. ah, the that's right. all back to the umvelt and stuff. So, right. uh, see is a stand-in for right. obviously. I don't know how we would be interpreting this world right. Right. in the movie The Matrix. It is right. green code, right? So right. 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 when he explodes the agents, they explode right. into code. Right. So code is their fundamental mm-hmm. element. Um, what is your fundamental element? Consciousness. I get that, right. but right. now I'm trying to understand like how if it's consciousness all the way down what is consciousness like is it a physical substrate or is it not and we have to let go of the very notion of physicality yeah we're i'm letting go of physicality in the sense i'm completely letting go of space and time and and particles electrons protons and neutrons those are only headset entities but is it fair to say that you have no idea then exactly what consciousness is you just well so so what we do, so here's, this gets at the fundamental way we build scientific theories. And this yep. is what we talked about a little bit earlier, which is about every theory has miracles, right? So every scientific theory has certain assumptions that it makes. That we just have to grant you. We just have to grant. No, there's no theory of everything. We, we hear about a theory of everything. There is none. So your miracle is consciousness. That's right. Okay. So, there, so I'm saying that there are entities that I'll call conscious agents. These agents themselves are not conscious experiences. Why do they have to be networked? Well, it, it, it turns out that when agents interact, they form new agents. So when it, and I didn't know this when I wrote down the math. I was just writing down what, what could I possibly mean by consciousness being fundamental. Mm-hmm. And I wrote down the minimal structure I could think of that could have some set of experiences. So there's some set of experiences that this creature, this entity could have mm-hmm. and a small set of actions that it could take. And that was all I wanted to write down. But then when I had them interact with other agents, right, because the actions are to affect the experiences of other agents, it turned out the interactions satisfy the definition of a conscious agent. So, so when agents interact, they form new agents. Let me ask a question that I think is going to um, explode this apart and help us all understand what you mean. Okay. Do I exist? Um, yes. In what way? 
so you, your conscious experiences exist. So all I can see is your skin, hair, and eyes. Yep. I see, but that's just my interface symbol. If you look at yourself in the mirror, all you see in the mirror is skin, hair, and eyes. But you know firsthand that what you don't see in the mirror, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your headache, all the rich world of your conscious experiences, that is not visible in the headset. So my conscious experience is both in the headset and outside of the headset. That's right, that's right. So it exists outside of space and time. That's right. In fact, this is where the shit starts to get real weird. It's pretty interesting because all I can see of you are the experiences in my own headset. Mm -hmm. And so my headset is made up of my own experiences that I've put in a particular format of space and time. And so, so it's just a format. Like in a VR, for example, you have a certain format in which the VR is presented. That th 3D VR format has nothing to do with the shape of the supercomputer. Mm -hmm. It's just the format of, of, of that. And so this, what I see of Tom right here is just what my headset allows me. But I believe, and you know firsthand, that what I can't see in my headset is this rich world of your conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. When I look at my cat, my headset only shows me fur and something really cute. And I believe that behind that cute little icon in my, my interface, my headset, there is a real consciousness, but I have less insight into the consciousness than I have into a human. With a mouse, even less. With an ant, even less. And then when I get to things that I call rocks and you know protons and neutrons, I have no insight at all. No surprise, the whole point of a headset is to simplify things. Does this conscious entity need to eat? Very interesting, because that gets to what? See, this is now outside of space and time. It's not evolution. It's not food and so forth. So the question is, what are these agents up to? What are they doing? What's the? Why are they having any kind of actions at all? And the answer is, I don't know yet. I've got a, math, a mathematical definition of conscious agent. We're starting to play with dynamical systems of them. And as to the question of why they would have any dynamic, why would consciousness do something as opposed to nothing? What, what kind of answer could be deep enough? Or at least what, what kind of proposal could be deep enough? And I, I've only had one idea ever that I've heard that seems deep enough to at least be on the table. And that's consciousness all the way down. Well, no, no, I'm saying if we assume it's consciousness all the way down, yep. what, what are all those consciousnesses up to? What is the social network doing and why? Okay. So the and, idea is the social network? What's, well, the, what's the one idea? So the, so the one idea is the girdle is incompleteness theorem, right? So if consciousness is all there is, conscious agents are all there is, yep. then mathematical structure is only about consciousness and conscious agents because that's all there is. And that means girdle telling us that there's endless exploration of mathematical structure means there's endless exploration of the possible kinds and varieties of consciousness and conscious agents. And what consciousness is up to is, is what I call the kid in the candy store theory. Girdle tells us there's an infinite candy store of exploration of possible conscious structures. And the candy is all the variations of, of consciousness. Conscious consciousness and conscious experiences. That's right. And that's, I, I'm not saying it's right, but at least it's deep enough All right. that it could be, you know, it, it's on the table. Okay. So here's the good news. I, I am the guy that's uh, mm -hmm. dumb enough to like need everything explained and good. hopefully that will be useful to the yeah. audience. Uh, okay. So I've got this infinite candy store of right. consciousness. The thing I cannot get past is... There's some, there is utility in creating the headset. Otherwise, why the fuck would it exist? So if there is utility in the creation of the headset, first of all, I get it probably begs mm -hmm. questions that it, you, you don't know and it's beyond mm -hmm. the, the scope and you've already asked me to just accept that the miracle is consciousness and you're not gonna mm -hmm. tell me anything beyond that because nobody has a theory of everything. Respect, get that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanna poke in the spirit of fun partly sure. and then just to see sure. like where the sort of edge cases are. Sure. All right. So we don't know if conscious entities need to eat. And the reason that I asked that question was <laughs> because all of this starts with you looking at fitness. And so if there is fitness into taking multiple bites of the apple, therefore logic is going to be born out of that so that I know to keep eating the apple. Um, 
But then it begs a question of, well, what am I underneath the visor, or underneath the headset, just to right. keep our nomenclature consistent? Mm -hmm. What am I beneath the headset? And why does it matter that I have a representation that that is based in the idea of fitness of eating an apple, right? right? So that's where I'm like, right. what what is that a representation of why right, does this representation need to exist? Right. Like, have you, I'm sure you've daydreamed about oh, this well, even absolutely. if, okay, let's hear it. Those are the fun questions, right? That's, that's what we're really interested in is ask, answering those questions. And so we're going at it in two different directions. One is, you know, sitting back in our armchairs and trying to think like, Girdle's incompleteness theorem and so forth and saying, could this be? And what Can I repeat what Girdle's incompleteness <clears throat> theorem is? It's the one part of this I'm nodding and smiling, but I'm like, the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> uh, so it goes something like this and you will tell me where I'm wrong. So uh, in fact, God, can I even articulate what I think? I'm, I'm going to fumble through this. Okay. I, I don't even, I feel like I understand a middle piece of it. I don't okay. know where it begins right. or where it ends, right. but that we have some sort of mathematical equation that says you're never going to find the limit to which you can uh, explore one thing, but I don't get why that thing is, Gödel's incompleteness theorem has nothing to do specifically with consciousness, right? No, no, with no. Somebody no. leveraging that to explain right. why is it then that consciousness is the only thing that you've seen put on the table that right, right. Uh, ties into that. Oh, well, so, okay, the reason I went after consciousness was I've, I've been trying to solve what's called the hard problem of consciousness. How is consciousness related to brain activity? Yes. And so people have been trying to show how consciousness can be booted up from brain activity, and we've utterly failed to do that. Or how the illusion of consciousness could be booted up from brain activity. And there are no mathematic, absolutely no mathematically precise theories after decades of effort that could explain even one specific conscious experience or one specific illusion of conscious experience, like the taste of vanilla, or why, we, why this kind of brain activity must be the illusion of the taste of vanilla, why it could not be the illusion of the taste of chocolate. There's nothing on the table. I mean, there's no science that can predict even one specific conscious experience or one specific illusion of conscious experience. And so the reason I went after consciousness being fundamental, the reason I went after that, that's different from Gödel's incompleteness there, was that I didn't want to be a dualist, right? So when, as scientists, we try to create a theory based on as few assumptions as possible, and we only want one kind of assumption. We don't want to have like, I want this physical stuff and I want this consciousness stuff. You, you, you have to choose. Pick either physical stuff that's unconscious or pick consciousness stuff that's not physical, but don't, don't do both. If you do both, that's dualism and, and it's not, is not as clean. Maybe we'll have to, but we don't want to go there. So, so maybe dualism will end up being where we have to go, but I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with uh, physicalism doesn't seem to be working out. It seems to be principled. And evolution. physicalism is that you can stack enough neurons together that they suddenly become conscious. That's right. And space and time are fundamental. And that's where this, what evolution is basically saying, physicalism is false. That's why I went after evolution. Natural selection says the language of space and time is not the language of objective reality. That means physicalism, as we currently conceive of it, is false. We can't boot up consciousness from neural activity because neural activity is just a data structure in your headset. Neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. They couldn't possibly create consciousness. They're not even there. Consciousness, I'm proposing, creates neurons when we look inside skulls, but neurons could not possibly create consciousness. And I was forced to that by looking at natural selection. So I'm proposing that if I believe that I really do have headaches mm -hmm. and I really do taste chocolate and I really do have conscious experience, and again, I could be wrong about that, it could be an illusion. And just to be clear, mm -hmm. in fact, we never finished this because I'm still, I'm just paralyzed by Gödel's incompleteness mm -hmm. theorem, but we're going to move on from that to not browbeat the poor audience. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to uh, this network of conscious agents, right. you're saying, and, and this gets into the part about the brain I wanted to talk about. So split brain patients can have an experience of being literally two separate people. So mm -hmm. you go in, you mm -hmm. cut the corpus callosum. So Everybody, to your point, for a minute, I'm going to assume that the brain actually exists. Sure, sure. Uh, so you go in, you cut the corpus callosum, which allows for communication between the two hemispheres of the brain, and suddenly you realize that two personalities will emerge right. within the same head. Um, do they? They don't both have internal dialogue, do they? 
They have different likes and dislikes. But do they have an internal? Because one side yes. handles language. So they both do they have... They both okay. have language. Perfect. Actually, so, the right hemisphere is very adept at language. Fascinating. So right. they mm-hmm. both have language. One could be an atheist, the other devout, which is so crazy. And that's a that's real right. example, right, from the yeah. literature? Yeah. There was, My friend V.S. Ramachandran um, has a video online. On the show. If you, He's so if fascinating. You, you can Google that and say, you know, split brain patient, Ramachandran, this patient has, you know, belie- atheist and a believer. And one, mm. you know, I think in his case, the right hemisphere didn't believe and the left hemisphere was a believer. It's crazy. I've never one, seen the video, but that's oh, it's it's, it's it. great. In one case, the right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver. The left hemisphere wants to be a draftsman. They have just completely different personalities. They can play twenty questions with each other. You can give a word to the right hemisphere, and the left hemisphere will will sometimes fail in twenty questions. They can't figure out what's in the right hemisphere's head. Whoa. So there, so there are separate contents of consciousness, so separate that you can lose at the game of twenty questions with your other hemisphere. That's insane. Right. So. <laughs> Your, that would be a very sort of simplistic example of two different conscious agents that have come together. That's yes? right. That's, and that's the idea. So you are one conscious agent. I but, Well, the way that I perceive myself is as one conscious agent, but right, aren't right. secretly I just a whole bunch of conscious agents? Well, that's, that's, that's the thing. You are, it's both are true. So you are one conscious agent, but you're also two, and you're also probably a huge lattice of interacting conscious agents. You know the microbiome, yeah? A little bit, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, right. so mm-hmm. in your gut, you have like trillions of bacteria. It's crazy. Right. You have more foreign cells in your body than you have your own cells. Right. <laughs> uh, would they be conscious agents? Nothing in space-time, strictly speaking, is a conscious agent. So but do they not speaking. represent something? That's another thing. I've, okay, well, I've sure, resisted sure. asking you this question because sure. I think I know how you will answer it. The very, like, no one knew the microbiome existed. Right. So if this is all in my headset, how is something so detailed that once somebody looks, it's like, oh my God, it's proliferating. Right, it, right. There's all this stuff. How can we discover something new right, right. if it's literally just made up? Like the first time that somebody cracked open a skull, why did everyone look at it and see the same brain? The first time we looked into the microbiome, why do we all see the same thing? Shouldn't a novel thing that evolution did not prepare us to see and understand, right, right. like how do we all see the same thing? Now, I think I actually know how you're going to answer it. Right, because once you have a good visualization tool, it depends on where you take it. So I could take my visualization tool for the Twitterverse, right? And I can zoom in on Irvine to look very, very close. And I can zoom back and look at the whole United States and see what that looks like. So a good visualization tool for a social network lets you zoom in and out. And you'll but see doesn't new stuff. that assume that everything... Oh, God, let's see if I can articulate this. Sure. Doesn't that assume that tweets are a substrate that is universal? So that uh, the, the, the first image that came to mind was why the hell the first time somebody got their head bashed open did everyone see brain the same way? And I thought, okay, well, he's gonna say that the reason they did is because you have a facsimile in the headset for um, <coughs> tissue that's made from atoms. And so like that, that visual structure, it doesn't care like what it is. It's photoreceptors mm-hmm. taking in. I see this much mm-hmm. uh, light on this receptor, this on that, all that. So it's like, hey, I have a system for dealing with visuals. And therefore, when photons bounce off of this thing, it's going to construct something. And I understand things about mm-hmm. 3D and mushiness and texture mm-hmm. and all that. And so my brain is programmed for that. So no matter what you put in front of it, it's right. it's going to see that. I assume that is correct. R- roughly. But this is the it's more like if you are trying to look at the Twitterverse and you have a, you, you, if you design a really good tool and it lets you zoom in to what's happening just in your block versus in your city versus in your county versus in your state versus your country versus the whole world versus Europe and so forth. If the tool is really good, it's going to let you, you will see different kinds of structures as you move in. Maybe it's very, very all the same in my block where you know we all have similar ideas and we do the same thing or in my, my county, mm-hmm. but it'll be very different. And so, so the reason we see, right, when you look inside of a brain, you are not just, a, and you see all these neurons and so forth, you're not just one agent, you're two, you're a whole lattice of conscious agents. What we're doing is using our visualization tool to look at the whole list of conscious agents that are together forming you. So we're using that visualization tool to look in finer, finer detail at agents that perhaps are having smaller and smaller sets of conscious 
conscious experience. But we don't <clears throat> really know that it's a one-to-one relationship between many, a cell or whatever or, and what well, I see myself Yeah, it's going to be many-to-one. That's right. So, for example, I, mean, I, I see someone I call Tom in front of me, but that's a, I see one Tom, but I, my theory is proposing that, that there are countless conscious agents that I'm interacting with. There's one highest-level conscious agent, but immediately below it, there are two that I associate with what I call the left and right hemisphere, and then below each of those, there's countless more. And there's more than one personality in Tom. The right and left hemisphere agents probably have very, very different personalities. It seems to be a general trend. But they're, they're very, very different. And who knows what goes among all those agents all the way down. So my visualization tool, of course, all I see right now is skin, hair, and eyes. That is pretty simple compared to what I'm claiming but you really are. really good looking skin, hair, very, and very eyes, good if we're good. honest. And it's a really complicated and intelligent the network of conscious agents, but I see just very, very little. But when I look in, when someone looks inside and sees a brain, the 86 billion neurons they're seeing there is my visualization tool telling me there is a lot of conscious agents in a really complex social network going on here. That's what I'm seeing is 86 billion neurons. And then when we get down to chemistry, which is, you know, explode, that's even more and more complicated. Now, you know, saying, well, my, my interface is starting to give up because you're, you're not seeing much about consciousness. With, with neurons, you might be getting some notion of networking and s- exchanging information. Maybe at the, you know, biochemistry, you're not seeing that quite as well. And when you get down to, you know, quarks and gluons, you may be giving up, but there's tons and tons of quarks and gluons. And that's my interface telling me, look, I can, I'm showing you a lot about Tom. I'm not showing you too much about his two hemispheres, you know, the two agents. Right. I'm showing you very, very little, but I'll, you know, I'll show it to you in what you call, you know, 86 billion neurons. Mm. And then, the, uh, and eventually my interface is going to have to just give up because, I mean, the whole point of the interface is the network of conscious agents is too complicated for you to grok. Mm. You can't grok it. So we, I'll give it to you one agent at a time. Here's Tom. Not even Tom's left and right hemisphere, just Tom. And then all the agents, if you want to, you know, you can get out. You know, if Tom will let you, he can, we can go in there and look in his brain and we can... Tom will not let you. Yeah, Let's I don't think he will. That's right. I wouldn't. That. That's right. <laughs> so that's why the tool is showing us more complexity all the way down. It's, it's a vast social network. And each agent isn't just a standalone. We're, we're a combination of many, many other agents. And that's going to be one part of the theory that's really interesting is mathematically precisely looking at all the ways that agents can combine. Mm. But agents do combine. Uh, we'll be going to some new mathematics, I think, something called um, infinite categories in Topoi. Where infinite I, categories what? I, infinite ca- so it's category theory, and it's called infinity categories. And also Tolpoi theory. Some, some Tolpoi? T-O-P-O-I. What right. the hell is that? It's uh, some fairly abstract mathematics that allows you to economically start to describe countless other ways of interaction. And so what I want to... Re- I mean, I have a few ways that my current mathematical model, which just uses things called Markovian kernels and measurable spaces... Obviously. Plotting for right. what... I mean, most, most mathematicians would, would say it's, it's fairly plotting, but, but it's... it's it's, it works, and it's, it's real math. We can start with that and then go to these you know, category theories and so forth to actually get the full richness of all the kinds of ways that they could, could connect and, and interact. And so mm-hmm. I, I want to go after that. Um, but the, the, the one question you asked earlier was, why does it look like we have to eat? And do the conscious agents themselves have mm-hmm. to eat? And what are they up to? And how can we know? And here's... Here's my answer to that. First, I don't know the answer. So, so here's how I'm going to go after it. First, I, I am thinking like Gödel's incompleteness theorem. We can come back to it. That might be a deep motivation for the whole dynamics. But suppose I'm, that's wrong, and I realize it's wrong, and I realize I'm just not smart enough, and my team is just not smart enough to figure out what conscious agents are up to and why they're doing it and so forth. What the, here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to propose a mathematical projection from the dynamics of conscious agents into space and time and propose how that dynamics gets represented in terms of, for example, quarks and gluons interacting. Uh, Right now I'm studying scattering amplitudes at the Large Hadron Collider. I want to show how I can predict scattering amplitudes when two gluons hit, four gluons go spraying out from the dynamics of consciousness. The, the reason for doing that 
is that if I'm not, well, a couple of reasons, but one is if I'm not smart enough to figure out what consciousness is about, what I'll then do is say, here's a mapping in, that gives me back space time. Now, now that I know what, what's happening in space time, I'm going to pull it backwards mm -hmm. and say, what does that tell me about the dynamics of consciousness? And I'll go, oh, I never thought about that. So, so conscious agents have to be interacting this way for it to look like this in my headset. So if I'm too stupid to figure it out, and it's, it's very, very likely, I will have to take my theory of conscious agents, project it into my headset, and say, what would it look like? Oh, I'm getting the wrong answer. Okay, so I need to change my dynamics of consciousness this way. So it really looks like the scattering amplitudes of quarks and gluons in the Large Hadron Collider. And when I get that match, then I go, okay, this is at least one dynamics of consciousness that gives me the right answer in my headset. Now, what is it telling me about what consciousness is up to? Mm -hmm. So if I'm not... If, if we're not smart enough to do it from first principles, and I want to do it from first principles, but if I can't, I'll try to reverse engineer relativity theory, evolution by natural selection, uh, quantum mechanics, reverse engineer all of those, pull them back to the realm of conscious agents, look what they're saying about the social dynamics, and then try to get a clue about what that's about, and answer questions like, am I forced to think that they need to eat, or is there some deeper principle? Is, is it, for example, that I can only send an experience to another agent if an agent sends an experience to me? Is there, is there that kind of dynamics? That, and, and is it going to be like um, the small world networks we see, for example, in the internet, where you get big hubs like Google and Apple, which get lots of hits, and then tiny little guys like Hoffman, who gets almost no hits, and then a few in between, but, but, but you get this. And, and there's, in some sense, the number of social connections you have is some sense your notion of fitness. The creators of Google are billionaires. Hoffman's not a billionaire. There's a correlation between the number of hits that Google had, gets, the number of hits Hoffman gets, and the difference in mm. richness. Now, is that a deep property of these conscious agent networks or not? See, these are the, and this is what was fun about science. I don't know the answer. Evolution by natural selection has told me it's not in space and time. It's saying, it's not, this is all a headset. You're going to have to think as a scientist out of the headset, but I, I can't tell you what's outside the headset. Mm. So we have to be very imaginative and we have to choose what we're going to go after because of course we're probably going to be wrong. So you need to choose what you think is going to be interesting. I'm going after consciousness because I'm trying to solve this hard problem of how is consciousness related to our brain activity. Mm. And uh, I'm, the mathematics is forcing me to see this vast social network. If I bring it to consciousness, there's this whole network. But I don't know what it's about. All the science that we've ever done, all the science that's ever been done so far, has only been in our headset. Quantum field theory assumes space-time. The fields are defined over space-time. Relativity is space-time. Mm. And evolution by natural selection has been about what evolves in space-time. All of our science, which is very, very good science, has been in our headset. We've never really stepped out of our headset, but science has the tools. There is some initial work. There's a guy named Nima Arkani Hamed at Princeton, uh, Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, who I think is taking some really important steps beyond the headset because he's, he's already realized space-time is doomed. And so he is already being very adventurous and stepping outside of space-time and looking for mathematical structures in which space and time and quantum mechanics do not appear. All right, I'm, and there, there's them. something I find super interesting in this whole concept of space-time is doomed. Right. If we abandon space-time, it begs a question about causality. So right now, I cannot believe this is true, but this is true. On Monday, I have two memorials to go to. Young people, oh. crazy. I'm literally heartbroken. And the oh. fact that they oh. both have memorials on the same day is too weird to even contemplate. Mm. So that got me thinking about the very nature of death. But if time doesn't exist, right. is there like so causality requires time. It requires you to be moving through time for something to happen first that then creates another knock on effect, another knock on effect, so on and so forth. But if time doesn't exist, and I mean, admittedly, we don't know what it's being replaced with, but theoretically, we know that it isn't going to be like we perceive it now. So if time doesn't exist, then like where is that notion of entering the the time stream of breaking out of seeing this as a, a linear equation and obviously tying it to death being 
I would love to think that there's some way to right. once again interact with these people right. if I can just take the headset off. Right. Um, do you have any intuitions or is there any math around yes. like if it if it isn't for, let me just ask one question is cause and effect real outside of the headset I think inside the he inside the headset no so we have a useful fiction inside the headset you don't think there's cause and effect right well we have the appearance of cause and effect right so if I hit the the cue ball mm -hmm. and it hits the eight ball into the corner pocket it looks like the cue ball caused the eight ball to careen into the corner pocket yes and that all works but it's a fiction of causality in the old video game of pong you have these little paddles and this ball and you hit and it looks like the paddle is causing the ball and and the fiction of causality is good enough that you can play a game you can actually figure out how to put maybe a little spin on it and so forth or in you know more more advanced games like you know virtual reality or games or you know like Grand Theft Auto, you have a nice fiction of causality. I turn the wheel to the left, my car goes to the left, turn the wheel to the right, but it's all a fiction. The wheel has no causal powers. The gas pedal has no causal powers, but it's a useful fiction. Evolution I'm gave not, us I'm a useful stop you there. fiction. I don't know that that's true. So think about okay. a system was created. Let's, let's take the analogy of Grand Theft Auto. So right. Right. A, a system is created such that it awaits input from your your control pad, whatever that control pad right. may be. Right. Right. Now, admittedly, my control pad, I press it. An electrical signal is sent to something that you know, turns on mm -hmm. or off or opens or closes or whatever, and then a whole cascade of things happens. Right. Right. But it it is, I mean, you could even trace back the causality to I ate something that right. gave me the ability to create ATP, which gave me the ability right. to generate electricity, which gave me the ability mm -hmm. to fire a muscle, right. which gave me the ab ability to press a button, which triggered this electrical mm -hmm. chain reaction that caused something to happen on the screen. Right. But it it there is a chain of causality in the headset. There is a chain of causality in the headset. Like even, even though it is the perception is that, you know, I'm uh, turning and the act of actually just moving that thing makes it turn. So I get that that isn't happening, but it does create this chain reaction that can be in the headset understood. Right. And so there I disagree. So if you look for example, in a, in a VR version of it where you see your virtual hands holding a virtual steering wheel. Yep. There's no feedback from the screen to the computer. Uh, there's no feedback from the screen to the computer, but That's there right. is feedback. Right. Like if you think about right. VR, but, but, so... but the, So there is, a, there is a real cause and effect, yep. but it's not what we see in the headset. It, on the headset, it looks like the wheel that I'm seeing in the headset, in the VR headset, is what's causing the car yes, to turn. Yes, but I am typically in VR, I would be mapping my real hands either by holding a controller or by right, having right, cameras. Right. Oh, absolutely. So I'm mapping my hands, my hands do a movement, right, and right. this <clears throat> program is right. programmed to wait for the input from the movement right. of my hands to then trigger that sequence that I just listed before. Right. So there is a cause and effect. Yep. But, but notice it's not from the things that you're literally seeing in the headset. I agree with that, but I'm saying, I'm saying, but there there still is a chain of cause and effect. Absolutely. Because when you say that it is right, an right. illusion of the eight ball hitting the thing, it's like, eh, that didn't seem well, true. Well, Within the construct of the headset, I'm saying. Right, right. Well, so, so maybe another example might help on this. So when you like drag your icon, you've, you've written an email and this icon is blue in the middle of your screen, you drag it to the trash can. Yep. You, you are using, say, a mouse or a touchpad. And, and, and in, so in this analogy, that would be the, like the real cause and effect. But if you said, the, but it's really the motion of the icon on the screen to the trash can that's causing the file to be deleted. That's just an illusion of causality, right? The, there's no feedback from the pixels of the screen into the computer. And that's what I mean. Everything inside space and time is like seeing the icons on your desktop. Things move around on your desktop, but it's due to something like your, you know, joystick or something else. But the headset, since the headset is all of space and time, what that means is that I'm saying that everything inside space time is part of that fictional causality. Okay, I now get what you're saying. So in the in the headset, that perception is illusion, and I was dragging a sort of back and forth between. But it's good. I mean, that's so a, very very good. Now take me outside. Does cause and effect right. exist if time doesn't exist? Right. So, so two answers, and then I'll get to the death question. Um, I think in the realm of conscious agents, there is a notion of cause and effect, but it, it boils down to a notion of free will. That seems to be 
one of the key notions of cause that in, in, in this. In quantum mechanics, by the way, I should point out that they, when you do quantum computations, normally in normal computations, there's a causal order. If you do this multiply and then an add, that order is important. If you do the add and then the multiply, you get a different answer, right? The order, the causal order. Is, but it turns out in quantum mechanics, you can do a, you can get rid of causal order when you do your computation. You can have a superposition of, you know, multiply followed by add with add followed by multiply, both orders. So you have a superposition of the causal order, and it's a theorem that in general you'll be faster, you'll be more efficient if you let go of causality in space time. And it turns out that it's actually been done when you build these things and let go of causality in space time, you tap, you tap into a greater efficiency. So when you let go of space time, you're also letting go. When, what space time is doomed means also that everything that we believed to be causality in space time was just a very useful fiction in our headset, just like the fictions in various VR games that we play. It's a useful fiction, it lets us play the game. Um, there is an underlying causal order, and we're arbitrarily ignorant about what that causal order is. Now about death. I don't know, but here's an, here's an interesting idea. Suppose you go to a VR arcade with some friends to play virtual volleyball, and you put on your headset and bodysuit, and you're on a, you know, a, like a beach volleyball scene, palm trees and sand and the net, and you're playing VR volleyball for a while, and then one of your friends you know, says, I'm thirsty, I need a drink. He takes off his headset and bodysuit to go, to go get a drink. Mm. His avatar sits lifeless on the sand. It collapses on the sand. It looks within the VR headset, within the game, as though he's dead. But he's, his consciousness has not ceased. He's merely stepped out of that interface. All right, now we're in what I'll call the Phineas Gage problem. Okay. So once, so Phineas Gage, for those who don't know, it was a railroad worker, one of the most famous examples in neuroscience. He's hitting a tamping rod. It's like a three foot rod, <clears throat> thicker than your thumb, and it shoots up through his right. jaw and out the top of his head, taking, if I remember right, right. a teacup's worth of brain matter, which seems impossible, but never loses consciousness. But they say he's forever different, right. mm -hmm. different. Right. And he used to be like super sweet and he was one of the best workers. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes this belligerent asshole and he can't hold a right. job. Right. So right. I will say that's, that is the, so using this notion of mm -hmm. the headset or the umvelt, it's like once you alter the way that his brain works, and I'm fully willing to accept that the, this is a problem only inside of the headset, but once you alter mm -hmm. that function, within the headset, he's fundamentally different. Now, if the headset is, is what I'll call the umvelt, it's our interpretation of the stimuli. Once he goes, mm -hmm. takes the headset off, Right. The inter now we're into transistors, diodes, electrical, gravity, or, oh, God, mm -hmm. I may have tripped this up with gravity, but mm -hmm. everything shy of that one. Mm -hmm. um, now you have, he, the experience of that person would be fundamentally different. I would be fundamentally different because I'm no longer experiencing mm -hmm. things through the lens of my brain, essentially. Right. So mm -hmm. while I, it would seem to me that there's right. no way around the fact that in the game, homie is dead and so, mm -hmm. or lifeless to use your example. Mm -hmm. So since that's the only thing that I want to relate to that person through my headset, right. that's what I'm used to. That's where the emotion lies. Right. And then now once I step outside, even emotion would be called in the question, almost certainly, in fact, right. Right. definitively in right. your explanation, right. the way that I process emotions, it would just be unrecognizable outside. Because I no longer have the brain, I no longer have all of those things. Mm -hmm. Interesting, you said quite possibly. Right. So there is a possibility to you that outside the headset, it's close to what we experience inside. Right. See, so for me, um, it's going to be a matter of following the math on this. So the theory of conscious agents itself doesn't require an agent to have a self. So, Meaning it can shatter into a bunch of little pieces? Well, that, 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 it, that a self is something that a network of conscious agents has to construct. Mm-hmm. So, so it would be the Borg? It would be like an interface representation. Okay. So my, what I call myself is, on this kind of view, no less a construction than space and time. And so it's not clear to me how much of that construction will survive death. 
Will meaning taking off the headset. Taking uh, off which the headset. are two possibly very different things. Well, it looks for for people who still had the headset on. It would be interesting. It looks to them like death, but for the person who's actually having the headset taken off, maybe it looks like what some people describe with psychedelic experiences or near death experiences and, and 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 so forth, or or you know like really extreme five DMT MEO DMT experiences and so forth like. These are things I want to explore. So at this point, I, I'll have to say, you know, not only, you know, I'm likely to be wrong, I'm still trying to figure out what the ideas are that mm. I would want to put on the table that are wrong. So, but the the theory of consciousness that I have right now doesn't require conscious agents to have a self, to have memories, to have the ability to learn or anything like that. So networks of conscious agents construct selves, they construct memories, they construct, emo, you know, patterns of logics of emotions and so forth. It's going to be very interesting to, to ask the question about how much when, you know, my, I, my parents died recently, right? So, you know, it's very, very, very it's very, very difficult, right? You, and so we all would like to think that there is some way to have contact with a person anyway. If you're a physicalist, of course, that's out of the question, right? If your consciousness is nothing above and beyond brain activity, then when brain activity ceases, there's no consciousness. End of story. It's very, very clear. In the theory of conscious agents, it's quite possible that, that yourself dissolves, but the conscious agents, it seems to me, will still be conscious agents. They've just maybe dissolved this particular data structure that they created, the space-time data structure with a particular personality and memories and so forth. So basically you're saying, uh, if I can just put different words around that to make sure that I understand, the the conscious agents coming together to form a person are a data structure. That, well, they form the person as a data structure. So everything that I believe about me is very different than what I believed when I was five. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't believe anything when I was maybe one. And so I've... Over the years, the decades of my life, I've put together this story. I've, I'm a, myself, this is sort of an idea that some of my physicalist colleagues have said, like Dan Dennett, a self is a story that we weave. It's a narrative that, that we give. Maybe there's something to that. Whereas where I wouldn't go with Dan, uh, you know, and he's a wonderful guy, he's, he's brilliant, but, you know, we, we are, it's okay to disagree. Right. He would say that, you know, there's nothing but the brain activity and the narratives that it creates. And I'm saying, well, I like the idea of the narratives, but, but the consciousness is the fundamental reality. I have to let go of physicalism because of evolution of natural selection. And so maybe consciousnesses won't keep the narratives. Maybe they will. I have some of my colleagues who are working with me who think um, you know, that we will keep the narratives, that we will keep that sense of self. But my colleague who thinks that doesn't have any mathematics to support it. Mm. And so for, for me, on the one hand, of course, I'm really open to all the different ideas. But as a scientist, if I can't put it precisely in math, I don't know what I'm talking about yet. I mean, you, and that's what you find is, unless you can make it absolutely pre precise, most of the time we think we know what we're talking about, and when we make it precise, we realize, oh, okay, no, I was maybe in the neighborhood, but I didn't really know what I was talking about. That's what mathematics really comes back and teaches you. And that's the thing about a really good scientific theory. Once you write it down, you become a student of your theory. Like, so Einstein, when he wrote down the equation of general relativity, mm -hmm. he had the big idea, falling in an elevator, you would feel weightless. Big, big idea, if it was free fall in an elevator. And he took him eight years to take that idea, and what he called the equivalence principle, and turned it into the equation of general relativity. He wrote it down, took him eight years. Hard, hard work to take your intuition and go, oh, no, my intuition. What, is, what do I really mean by that? It took him eight years. And he was Einstein. <laughs> so, right, right. For the rest of us, I mean, if Einstein's ideas aren't that quite precise, it take him eight years to get it so precise that he knows exactly what he meant, mm. that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. So he writes down the equation. A year later, a guy named Schwarzschild, who's in the front lines in World War I, is solving Einstein's equations on the front lines. And he, he, he solves the equations and he discovers black holes. And he writes back to Einstein and says, says, your theory says there are black holes. Einstein didn't know that. He didn't believe it. He spent decades dis disbelieving it. His equations were right, Einstein was wrong. The equations become smarter than the genius mm. who wrote them down. 
And that's another reason why we do these mathematical models of science. We take our intuitions, it might take us a decade to take our intuitions and actually figure out what we really were thinking and get them so precise that we say, oh, that's the only logically consistent way of stating what I thought I was trying to think. And once you've put it down there, then all of a sudden you become a student. That thing that you've written down is going to teach you. And that's what I have with this theory of conscious agents. When I wrote it down, I had no idea about a number of things. I didn't know that agents could combine. It, it was a friend of mine who pointed that out to me. He said, well, agents can combine. And also that, that a weird thing that it predicts is that our free choices are not part of our conscious experiences. You can't directly experience your own free choices. You can experience that you chose, but you can never actually experience yourself choosing. Why? It's, well, well it's, it's really quite interesting. You can experience, like, if, if, if I go, uh, you know, here's, there's chocolate and vanilla. I'm going to choose between chocolate and vanilla. Well, I, I just chose chocolate. But how did I do that? Well, I, I had some deliberation process, but when I finally, it, it, I can, all I can do is see myself reaching for the chocolate or the vanilla. I can see my cogitation processes, but, but the... But isn't that all in the headset? All that I'm seeing is in the headset. That's right. So I'm seeing... So, by the way, I only know my actions through my headset. I actually don't know what I'm doing. When I reach out and grab something, I don't know what I'm doing in objective reality, in the realm of conscious agents. How does all of this play out in your real life? And I've, I've heard you talk about right. that there are moments where you have, mm, I'm sort of putting words in your mouth, but almost a meditative mm -hmm. experience where you transcend the notion of self. Mm -hmm. um, how so, how do you stay so enthusiastic about this for so long when it seems like, I mean, really, really at a deep fucking level, man, as a human experience, this just all feels so real. Right, right. Well, I wouldn't say that I transcend the self, but I, what I do get it once in a while is a glimpse that, oh, this is just a headset. I actually feel it, that I'm just rendering this. Most of us feel like space just exists. I'm stuck inside space. There's this big stage. I'm on the stage. And it's very different. I think, by the way, the next generation will probably get this much easier. Those who have just been raised, they, they, spending a lot of time in VRs that are as compelling and as immersive as everyday life, mm -hmm. it's going to be just sort of obvious. You take your headset off and go, it's a no-brainer to think, well, this is just a headset too, and to just sort of be there. So I think that it'll, it'll be, for the next generation, the fact that I'm having a hard time about it, thinking about it this way and, and imagining it experientially, will just be sort of an artifact of the technology I grew up with. If I grew up with VRs that were really good as opposed to the stuff that we grew up with, which is not that good, then it would just be sort of obvious. You, you do it when you're young enough. It's just it's obvious that, that, yeah, I'm just seeing a VR headset too. Because, by the way, here's one way to think about it. If you close your eyes, you just see sort of gray, right? Modeled gray in front of you. So it looks, it doesn't look like nothing. It looks like modeled gray. But what is it like backwards, back through your head mm. when you close your eyes? Well, it's not modeled gray. It's nothing. And it's really, the first time you really, if you close your eyes and experience that, yeah, what is it like in front of me? Yeah, it's just gray, it's sort of modeled gray. What is it like behind me? Absolutely nothing. That's the headset. You only have a headset of space-time in front. There is no headset behind. Now, you have a, not a visual headset. Now, you have this, set, you know, I can put my hands back there and do stuff. So I, so I have this, like, but it's all a creation. It's all, and so I do get glimpses of that once in a while. But there were no, now put on the natural selection language, right? So I have to pick the language of the science that I want to use, you know, because I don't have a better language in some sense for, mm. for discussing this. Evolution, um, there were no selection pressures for us to see the truth. And so there were no selection pressures for us to not take space-time as the truth. And so we do. Piaget tells us, you know, when we begin to take objects as real, as we, you know, these aren't just like little data structures that you create, that they really exist all the time. He called it object permanence. And Piaget said that, you know, when a kid is about 17 months, 16 or 17 months of age, they don't have object permanence. You mm. take a little baby doll, put it in front of a child, they play with it, you put, put it behind the pillow, 
If they're 16 months old, they it just doesn't it exist. doesn't exist. Piaget said. And then, but at 18 months, now they go and crawl around and try to get mm. the object, you know, the baby doll, out of the behind the pillow. Later experiments showed maybe down to three or four months. But the point is, these experiments show that we're programmed. Now I'm using the evolution language. We're programmed by natural selection to buy into the illusion that objects exist even when they're not perceived, object permanence, when we're three or four months old. We're not rational. It's being done to us without our permission. And so by the time we come to the age of reason, it's, it's the water that we, we don't know that we're wet. It's the water we've been swimming in all of our life. We just have been programmed to take this as the reality. I took it for the reality. It was only because I couldn't solve certain problems, like the problem of consciousness, and it was only because when I looked at evolution, it began to tell me space-time is not the reality. It cannot be. It's the wrong language. It must be only like a headset that I was going, holy... S I mean, I still remember the first time I realized this must be just a headset. I had to sit down. It was such... I mean, I was a grown adult. I was like... I was, I was around 30 years old or something like that. Mm. The first time I realized this, it was such a shock. I had to sit down. Everything that I believed, all of a sudden disappeared. But of course, the next moment I was, again, visually believing I'm in reality. I'm seeing the truth. So the programming is there, but ever since that, that moment, when the ma it was the math that, that did it to me. So, what do you think created math? Very interesting question. My own thinking, in terms of this idea that consciousness is fundamental and conscious agents are fundamental, when we actually study consciousness, and there's been a scientific study of consciousness since 1860, it's called the field of psychophysics. There was a guy named Gustav Fechner who started the whole field, and a lot of my research has been in psychophysics, where we literally get mathematical models of conscious experiences, and we test people very, very carefully in the lab. We find that, mathematical experience, that, that conscious experiences are mathematically structured. My experience of this water bottle the mathematics is unbelievable. There are, you can write down differential geometry, you, reflectance functions. I mean, the mathematics is incredible. It's true of all of our conscious experience, of everywhere we look. Conscious experience, we, it seems so squishy, it goes through your fingers, how can you, there's mathematics. So the way I think about math and experience is that mathematics is like the bones of the living conscious experience. They're not, they can't be divorced from each other. There's more to experience than just math, but there's not less than math. There's math and more. And so that mathematics and conscious experiences have a, a deep, intimate relationship that I'm still trying to understand, but, but, but the empirical evidence is quite strong. I mean, all the psychophysics that people have done, we just find mathematical structure everywhere. And that's why I came back to this Gödel's incompleteness theorem, where, where, where that theorem is just saying, no matter how many mathematical structures you discover, you haven't started. There will be endless more structure. Where did that come from? Gödel figured out how to do this. So it came from... And can I, let me, right, right, maybe right, right, now right. I'm understanding it. So we once thought the atom was the smallest <laughs> structure and then we discovered there's something below that and something below that and something below that. Are you saying outside of the headset, there's just no end to the something below that? That's right. Interesting. That's right. That's right. That, and, and this is what Gödel's result is that there is no end to the mathematical structure. So that you is can the explore. incompleteness <clears throat> theorem that you will never be able to complete it? You'll never be able to get to sort of base. Oh God, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Base reality. That's I don't right. know another way to say that's it. Right. That's right. That that's what that Gödel's theorem seems to be telling us is that and no matter how complicated the mathematics is that you know, effectively you haven't even begun yet. And when you say theorem, I assume that means that this is a math equation that Gödel put forward, and not it's not Gödel's theory, it's Gödel's theorem. It's a theorem. In other words, it's true that we can't ever know all mathematical truths. Interesting. I don't understand math well enough to even know what to ask beyond that. So to me, we're, mm -hmm. my, my ignorance makes this a miracle. I'm willing to accept it just to um, not be abusive to well, the Well, I'll just give you a clue <laughs> about the kind of thing that he does, right? In the math? In the math. It's, okay. it, it, 
there are these things called self-referential statements that cause problems. Okay. So if I say, um, this statement is false. Now, was that statement true or false? Well, let's, let's look. If the, sta the statement is, this statement is false. Well, if it's false, then it's true. True, right. But, but well, what then is... <laughs> if it's true, that, then it's false. That, that's right. Yeah. So you get these, when you have self-reference, you get these problems that, that pop up. You know, the, so the, the barber of Seville cuts all and only the hair of those who don't cut their own hair. Who cuts the hair of the barber of Seville? Right. All these kinds of things. So Gödel was able to take this kind of thing and, and, and make mathematical statements self-referential. And he was able to create a sentence that said, that, that, a statement in mathematics that says, this sentence is true within the system, but can't be proved. So he was able to construct that. That's, that, and that's why he, so he actually has a theorem, so he proves. And, and then he shows that no matter, so if, even if you add that sentence in, there'll be a new sentence that's self-referential. That, and so what he shows by, by this, this kind of structure, of course, I'm, the, the, the true theorem and the true proof is, is incredible. There's girdle numbers. It's, you have to be not just a mathematician, you have to be a brilliant mathematician, a logician to even mm -hmm. understand it. So, so it's, it's very, very few people who actually understand but it. But every time you quote unquote solve it, it's self-referential again. That, that's right. It's, it's the self-reference that's the key. So it just so there's not in complete magic. I want to let you know that based on this mm -hmm. notion of a self-referential statement. But, but the bottom line is it shows that there's an endless, in principle, endless possibility of exploration of mathematical structure. And, and since I just mentioned that... So just to like <clears throat> almost give it a silly answer, it's the, the mathematical equation is what's below math and the answer is math. It's structure what's all the way math? down math, forever, math, math. forever, forever. But if consciousness is fundamental, that means that there's endless conscious structure, endless don't consciousness. Do you feel like that's just something that says we don't fucking understand? Like mm. that to me, quite frankly, mm. is as sort of, I just have to accept it as turtles all the way down. Saying math all the way down or consciousness all the way down is the same as saying turtles all the way down. There's just literally no difference in my limited mind. Right, so this is where we're gonna to have to come with every scientific theory, right? Every scientific theory will have some set of miracles. And that's, that bothers me as much as it bothers you. Yeah. I don't like it. But I, so when I bump up against that, I take a pretty, and I don't know, maybe this is stupid, enlighten me, but here's, here's where I come up. So I will routinely be asked if I believe in God. And the answer is no, I don't believe in God in any of the ways that people mean when they say God. But there is so obviously something that I don't understand that it is just self-evident to me, you would use the language, and maybe rightly so, that it, this is a headset. And so you have an intuitive sense that there's something beyond the headset and you have no idea what it is. And therefore you just say, there is something I don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. So um, even here's the thing that used to fuck with me as a little kid. Mm -mm. The universe is expanding. Expanding into what? When you build a house, mm -hmm. you build it on land, right? right? So the land is there, the land is on the planet. So it's mm -hmm. like, there's this sense of, um, to for it to expand, it has to expand into something. Therefore something had to exist. So it was very easy for me to just go, yep, there's something here I don't understand. The fact that um, general relativity and quantum mechanics don't play well together. Yep, there's something I don't understand. Like right. I am, I am very okay with just going, and there's something I don't understand. Right. It's it's the the part that gets hard for me is the it's math all the way down where it's it's no longer an acknowledgement of this is something we just don't understand. And it's saying and now believe that it's math all the way down. And I don't know that it really matters to be honest, but. That, that's right. where I always bump and go, eh. Well, yeah, there are two big camps on this. One is that we invent math, and the other is we discover it, right? So when a new theorem is published, did the person discover it or did they mm -hmm. invent it, right? That's, that's one of the big questions. If, if, Isn't it self-evident uh, that it has to be discovered? Well, and, uh, the, but if, if it is discovered, then Gödel... Gödel's incompleteness theorem says it is math all the way down, right? So that's 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 the thing. But if, if it's discovered, I'm sorry, if, if it's invented, then that points at us and says, who who is this discoverer? Who is this inventor that's doing all this? So I mean, so, and it's really important for everybody to understand that that every scientific theory, as we said earlier stops explanation stops there's going to be some place where we say grant me this please 
And if you grant me this, then I will explain everything else. Like Einstein says, grant me space and time. If you grant me space and time, I will write down these mathematics, and then it turns out there's black holes. and mm -hmm. They're all interesting stuff. We can do GPS because of Einstein's theory of special relati uh, gra general relativity. It, it gives you all this, but we are granting space and time. Now, someone else, like there's a guy named Seth Loy, who says, okay, I'm not going to grant you space and time. I'll start with quantum bits and quantum gates outside of space and time. It's just abstract quantum computational stuff. And I can show you how to boot up space-time, general relativity, from quantum bits and quantum gates. The curvature of general relativistic space-time has to do with the action of the gates and so forth. So he's no longer assuming space-time. He's explaining it. But now he's asking for a different miracle. Please grant, grant me quantum bits and quantum gates. Mm. Now you can imagine someone going, well, now I'm going to do better than <laughs> Seth Lloyd. I'm going to explain, I'm going to do something deeper than quantum bits and quantum gates. That's perhaps what what Yenimar Arkani Hameda is doing at, at, at you know, Princeton. Mm. So maybe he'll get quantum mechanics emerging from something deeper. But he will then say, grant me what he's asking for is the amplituhedron and some other structures like that. So if you grant me this amplituhedron, I can give you space, time, and quantum mechanics and, and so forth. So, so that's the nature of explanation. And I don't, I'm still try, having to come to terms with that. I would like to have a theory of everything and I can only, uh, only have a theory of everything except these assumptions for my theory. Mm. And those assumptions are my miracles. And so at the foundation of every scientific theory, there's this moment of humility. Explanation stops here. It also stops one other remarkable place. Whenever in our theory we have a probability that can't be reduced by greater knowledge. Right? So in a Newtonian world, if I flip a coin. In principle, if I knew in detail the mass of the coin and its distribution and exactly how I flipped it, I could tell you heads or tails with probability mm -hmm. one. But I don't know the initial conditions well enough, and so I have to give you a probability of a half. That's a subjective probability, epistemic probability. But suppose no matter, there's a probability that no matter how much I know, the probability can't completely go away. Then that's no longer epistemic. There's something more interesting going on. This was the debate between Bohr and Einstein about quantum mechanics. There are probabilities that come up there. Einstein was saying those probabilities are just our lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's no God doesn't really play dice. There's no fundamental probability going on there. Bohr said, no, 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 you don't tell God what to do. These are not epistemic probabilities. These probabilities cannot be reduced, period. They're probabilities for everyone, including God, metaphorical God. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you that came to me when I was reading is the double slit experiment is one of the weirdest thing in mm -hmm. physics for me. It right. really messes with me. So um, for people not familiar with the double slit experiment, you take a single photon, you shoot it through a slit, and if you're not... Uh, measuring it as it happens on the sort of back wall, you would see like a bullet mark, right? right. So you fire a single bullet, it goes through the slit and it hits the wall. Mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, sorry, that's if you watch it. If you don't mm -hmm. measure it, then it goes through like a wave and you get an interference pattern on the back. You can put another slit and mm -hmm. if you're watching it, it goes through one slit. If right. you're not watching it, then it goes through both slits like a wave. Uh, that always just seems so weird. Right. But if we, well, in fact, I'll, I'll ask, does your hypothesis about consciousness address the issue of the double slit experiment? Yes. So, so it will come out, I believe, that what those experiments are showing us is that if we assume that everything is happening in space and time and that space time is the fundamental reality, then we're going to be confused. What we're seeing is space time is just a visualization tool we're using for things that are happening outside of space and time. And so they're not constrained to travel through space and time. Absolutely not constrained. We're constrained to see them as though they're traveling through space and time. And that's why quantum mechanics looks so weird. But, but why does <clears throat> um, observing or not observing change its state? Because we're creating reality as we render it. It's that's the, what I was wondering. If this is right. the look at the moon, not look at the moon Exactly scenario. right. The moon does, the, in fact, Einstein asked one of his colleagues when they were walking, he said, do you really believe the moon doesn't exist or only exists when someone looks, doesn't exist otherwise? 
he was talking about quantum mechanics. And my interpretation of quantum mechanics is exactly that, that, that space-time itself doesn't exist when it's not observed. And therefore, the particles ins inside space-time don't exist. I don't hear exist. you talk about the double slit experiment. Doesn't that so... It potentially... Let me ask. Is that potentially like a, a proof of your theory? Well, I'll, unfortunately, there are no proofs in science. <laughs> there, you... Every theory has lots of hypotheses and auxiliary facts and assumptions and so forth. And if, if your theory doesn't come out quite right, you don't know what went wrong in it. And also, um, even if every experiment that you've done is compatible with your theory, maybe you just haven't been smart enough to think of the experiment that will take it down. So, so, so no real serious scientist would say that any scientific theory has been proved. Does it point in the right direction, though? It's like right. you, you bring up a lot of examples, but that's not one. Right. Is there well, a reason? Is there a hole in that one already that you see? Or Because no. to me, that, that is some compelling shit. Right. Like, hey, mm -hmm. you want to wonder or you want to know if the moon exists when you look at it or if it's right. garbage bin. Uh, I keep forgetting your right. language Garbage collected. Garbage, garbage collected. collected. <laughs> right, right. When you look away, boom, double slit experiment. Well, so the double slit experiment is completely compatible with what I'm saying. The reason I don't take it as a proof is because there are some physicalists who have the multiverse or many worlds interpretations of many worlds interpretations. So Hugh Everett, um, for example. So what these guys will say is that um, to really understand superposition and all these weird quantum things, you have to realize that whenever you make a measurement, whole new universes spin off, and all possible states that are allowed by the quantum state function, the wave function. Mm -hmm. Um, are in are true in some some universe, and so many serious physicists believe in in the many worlds interpretation and a related but but distinct thing of the multiverse, which is a, a slightly a different thing. They they think it, uh, that there are multiverses, and so <clears throat> what what is what is true is that local realism is false. So local realism is the claim that. Objects in space-time, like say a proton, have definite values of their properties, like position, momentum, and spin. Definite values, um, even when they're not observed. And there's two parts. That's the first part. And that they have influences that propagate no faster than the speed of light. We have very, very good evidence to say if, if we know anything, we know that local realism is false. But that leaves open whether it's the, the locality that's false. Things you could imagine things having pro influences faster than the speed of light. So, a guy named D, you know, David Bohm has a theory in which things have influences faster than the speed of light, or whether it's realism that's false. That which is what I'm claiming that realism is false. That a particle doesn't have a position or a momentum or a spin when it's not observed because you create it as a headset element when you observe. Mm. So that's so I, I say that. We know that local realism is false. I, I claim that's the realism that's false, but there are some who can claim it's the locality. Right, that's but this false. is an example of you saying you have to have a theory that can be backwards compatible, essentially. That's right, right, right. right. Makes that's sense. Right. I'm gonna ask you a super random question because I'm so curious. You have a wedding ring, so I'm assuming you're yes. married. So yes. I'm assuming you mm -hmm. love somebody. Yes. Um, right. that's, that's such a headset experience. Yes. How often are you sort of in sort of, hey, this really is real and I'm gonna treat it as such, and like, does your wife think this is all like, does she find this decidedly unromantic? Well, my wife is an artist. She's a very talented art artist. Her name is Gerilyn, or I call her Jerry. And she's, you know, she's um, not a scientist and she appreciates my science. And even though she can't really understand any of the math and I appreciate her art, even though I'm a monkey looking at Mozart, <laughs> right? You know, because I'm no artist. And so we have mutual respect for the talents, the complementary talents. And we sort of complement each other. And but do you just have to turn that part of your brain off that's like... A lot of time with her. Illusion. Well, with her, yes. Because I'm, she'll, she's happy for me to talk with her about it um, up to a point. And, and then we need to do something different. Right. And that's, that's healthy for me. But yeah. Do you want to... So one thing that I find interesting is people that believe that 
this is all a simulation and that if we just find the right equation, we could essentially exit the simulation. Right. And that's always struck me as um, intuitively false, that there would be no way to exit the simulation. Again, this goes back right. to what I was saying earlier about the person who takes their headset off. They, right, would, right. they would just be so fundamentally different the way that you right. would be processing right. data. There's right. no sort of core you, I think. Like right. I can't conceptualize. It feels to me unless the, I mean, God, is this what you're mm -hmm. saying? In fact, let me ask, is this what you're saying? That there is this, this uh, conscious agent that I, in the headset, I, in fact, no, there is a conscious agent that is me. And the way that I present to you right now is me with the headset on. But the conscious agent could actually possibly remain intact when it pulls off the headset. You addressed this a little bit earlier, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's now becoming more concrete in my mind. Right. It, it seems to me quite possible that conscious agents will continue to exist even when they step out of this. So I this could take the headset off, effectively exit the simulation, right. be like, what the fuck is right. all this around me, but still have yeah. a sense of emotion and attachment and love and well, dare quite, I say vision. Quite possibly in the sense that, that this isn't the only headset. So maybe by taking this but headset, the headset off, would essentially be my brain, right? So I'd be I'd be out of this headset, and would I necessarily be putting on another? Well, the headset isn't your brain. Using? Remember, the you, you, the headset isn't your brain. The brain is just one of the symbols in your headset for what I'm using for to all process. the agents for all the agents that are t combining to form you. So I I imagine that it's possible for an agent to go to a different headset. Could they go to no headset, or would they be uh, then existing in a realm of pure math? Well, and that that I don't know. So in the in the following sense, so so it's it. So the part that I think I'm confident about, but again, we'll see. Agents could get new headsets and a wide variety of them. So we could really explore, and we could, and it could be very and the different. The headset we can shorthand to Umvelt. That, that's a right. A different way of perceiving. I and can it jump may in not... a bat headset. I can jump in exactly a right. dolphin headset. And maybe let go of space and time and do something different than than space and time. My notion of self may migrate in the process, right? Well, I may keep some of my emotions, maybe not others. Who, who, who knows? I mean, Do you think of <clears throat> taking the headset off as, as a, an event horizon beyond which we just cannot possibly even guess? The, the mathematics that I've got says that a conscious agent always can have awareness without experience. There is the, the awareness without experience. That's right. The math is very clear about that. So when I write down the set, the space of possible conscious experiences of conscious agent, I have to write down what's called a probability space, which is a set of possible conscious experiences. With I think of awareness as I exist. Yeah, no, it's no, but no I. There's just awareness without an I. So this would so and uh, by the way, I. I uh, make no claim to be you know expert in any like mystical spiritual tradition like buddhism or hinduism or so forth uh, but i've i've been told that they do have this notion um and so i'm not speaking as an expert but i've heard that they have this notion of awareness without content and that certain meditators claim to 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 be there and you know i i meditate a little bit and i might get little glimpses of of a notion of awareness without a self without any particular content that's the closest i can get conceptually to thinking about a conscious agent without a headset it's a, a field of pure awareness but it, it transcends in any emotion any notion of self it, any specific conscious experience but you've <laughs> never done psychedelics because the number one uh, punchline no. that people say is yo you have no sense of self like you dissolve right, right. into right. oneness Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 Why don't you? I haven't. Um, I may at some point, um, you know, where what, it's legal and so forth. What's stopped so far? Well, what stopped me so far is, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I've been reading the experiences of people, so I'm benefiting from their experiences. Mm -hmm. I talk with, with people extensively, actually, some very, very extensively about their experiences. And so I've, I've studied them. Um, there is a price to pay. I, um, but only I'm, in the headset, but only in the headset. <laughs> well, well, and while I'm in the headset, see, I really, I'm so eager to pursue these ideas. I think I've gotten, I, I know people say, well, you, if you don't do it for yourself, you can't know what it's really like to be without a self. Well, 
but I can look at the math, and the math actually says, yeah, I'm seeing that in my math. So I've gotten the insight that I need there. Did you um, listen? But to, maybe I will do at some point. You know, <clears throat> did you listen to Sam Harris's podcast about taking five grams of psilocybin? I think I haven't heard him do Dude, that. It's very interesting because I know you know Sam. Mm-hmm. Um, you yeah. must listen to that podcast. Okay, it is fucking fascinating. And he was okay. talking about the fact that, um, and I haven't done it either, by the way. Uh, so, right, I, right. and I have a very clear. I am a physicalist. Is that what you call right, it? Right, right physicalist. Uh, right. So, because of that, I'm like, I am not fucking with my brain. Like, I'm super right, paranoid. Right, right, right. I do. Part of me wants to do it. So if you cut my corpus callosum, right, right. one hemisphere wants to do psychedelics right, right, yeah. really badly. Right, right, and right. the other side is like, get the fuck out of here. Right, We're right, right. not doing psychedelics. This is a right. very bad idea. Absolutely. So no, I'm, 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 I'm sort of agree. stuck in this like right. go, no go scenario. Anyway, Sam yeah, was talking about. I agree. About, that's when I said there's a price to pay. That's exactly what yes. I was. That's, that's the di- I am dialogue. super paranoid. Right, right. So Sam said in, in the <laughs> experience, he had a moment where he... He forgot that he did drugs. Like he had no sense of, oh, I have taken a drug to be in the state right. and I'm simply in the state and I'm going to be in the state forever and this yes. is what life is. And yeah. he was like, it, it is a type of hell where it is just, right, it's, right. Uh, now I'm putting words in his mouth. The feeling I got, and he may have actually said this, was that it was like a form of just never ending terror. Right. And so you sort of pass through that and he was like, there are other moments where it's, it's never ending bliss and you're like, it's going to be blissful forever. Right. And it was just, ooh, the thought of where you have no concept, I have done something to myself where I have taken a drug and this is a consequence of that and it will ultimately right. wear right. off. Uh, that It's interesting. Right. It right. is interesting, man. And I get how that can right. really right. shape right. people's right. Right. perception of what is real and like really shake you loose. Exactly. Because it's... As I read this stuff, and for anybody that's made it this far, first of all, congratulations. This shit is so deep and so heady. But the more time that I've spent with your ideas, the more I actually, I feel like someone is sort of filing off a callus on the bottom of my foot. Mm. And it's like, ooh, whoa, we're getting to like a different sensation here. I never realized that I had uh, mm. a perception in, you know, when you've got the mm. calluses that are like half an inch thick. It's like, right. you just forget that that can actually feel something so right. the more time i've spent with your ideas the more i'm like man there really is something here and so i the first note i took on you was so arrogant and so aggressive mm-hmm. and i was like dude does this guy not realize that he invalidates his own theory right, right, right. by saying like this is about natural selection because i didn't understand your whole thing about math and reason mm-hmm. Right. So, but then you like you start spending more time with me. Like, fuck, I can't just discredit this. Right, right. Then you start exploring it. Like, I definitely before I started thinking about your stuff, diehard physicalist. Sure. I will probably regression to the mean, right? So I'm gonna slide sure. back sure. to that unless right, right, I right. really spend time on this because it is such right, right. a compelling illusion. Absolutely. Uh, but right. it it does. I can feel things pushing me at my back to experiment with psychedelics for mm-hmm. reasons like this, where I, yes, I could meditate for the next 40 years and maybe right. get to the point where I could have one of those experiences of what it means right. to be aware without right. a sense of I. I. I literally can't imagine what that is right now. Right. I can imagine blanking out. Right. I can't imagine having a sense that there is awareness without um, me being inserted somehow right. into that. That's right. Um, so it would be really fascinating to very quickly be ejected uh, out of you know my normal state of consciousness and into this. And right. part of part of what I promised myself mm-hmm. I would do in this interview mm-hmm. is to really figure out like why the fuck does this all matter? Like mm. you, right. and that's why I'm like I'm dancing around this idea of like you love your wife. Like there there right. is mm-hmm. a realm in which you're like the headset is pretty rad and it's given right. me amazing right. shit. And I'm really having a hard time like actually stepping outside of the headset. Mm-hmm. And so, so much of my life is predicated on the headset. It, right. it may not even be possible to retain mm-hmm. myself, which I value, I'm assuming, right? So I value myself. I value mm-hmm. this experience. Right. I fucking value my wife. Right. That's right. the one that really scares me. Right. Like, right. Right. I get so much out of my wife. Like I've imagined, right. my wife and I actually had this conversation one time. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, mm-hmm. a magic genie shows up, what do you wish for? And she was like, please don't wish for super intelligence. And I was like, why? Like, that's such a rad option, right? Mm. To be the smartest human that ever existed. And she Mm. said, if you did that, you'd no longer be in love with me. And I was like, fuck, you're actually right. Because if you're, you wouldn't love any human anymore. Like I love my dogs, but not like I love my wife because there's such a gap in in how we can relate to each other. So when I think about like, Right. Stepping outside of the headset, man, you're giving up everything that you value. And that's right. like really, right. really trippy. Mm-hmm. Now, I admit, if you told me, hey, Tom, here's like a pill you can right. take right. and it's going to give you a little peek outside the headset, I'd be like, 
right? I'd have to do it. I'd have to take a peek. I'd right. have to see like what mm -hmm. it was. Because I don't believe that drugs are necessarily punching through to some truth, right. I don't find myself like super compelled to do it. But the idea of looking beyond is both exhilarating and terrifying because of yes. that loss yes. of the things that I, I am so invested in. Yes, I I'm on the same page with you, and and it's you know, interaction with my wife is one of the greatest pleasures is you know it makes life meaningful and my my daughter and i've got three grandkids and and you know my son-in-law was and you know my students and uh, son-in-law made the list not bad Good yeah yeah you. absolutely yeah yeah jay is a great guy and and in this case i'm interacting with other conscious agents and i'm benefiting so i'm now going into my theory this is now sure. it seems impersonal but, but i'm going back to the theory it, within the framework of the theory it, there's a dynamics of conscious agents as, as, as conscious agents interact that they they learn, they get new comprehensions, and they create new agents. So what we're doing in this headset, in terms like we're, we're interacting, there's something new. This we're both growing, we're both learning from this experience. We're we come away from it different, and that seems to be part of it. If this kid in the candy store theory of consciousness is on the right track then we're experiencing it right now. We're kids in candy stores. We're, we're exploring and we're wondering what's on, the, what's, what's on the next shelf of candy, right? That's what we're saying here when we say, well, well I'd love to see if, if I take five or what, hap what happens, what's going on there. So that may be, you know, what it's really about is that it's exploration. And maybe, you know, in meditation, one thing that does happen is that you get less and less grasping of things that you used to be grasping about. And you, I, I find that I'm able to, to let go of things that fears, for example, but in, uh, pictures of myself. It's, it's, it's really, in some sense, a dismantling. A, a, the, the best metaphor I can come up with is, is I read sometime that when a caterpillar goes through metamorphosis, right, goes into a cocoon, the, the, the immune cells of the caterpillar try to kill, and they do kill, the cells that are trying to begin the process of transformation into a butterfly. And for a while, the immune cells of the caterpillar, it's a battle, and, but eventually the immune cells of the caterpillar get overwhelmed. And then much of the caterpillar liquefies. Now that can't be fun, right? I mean, I mean liquefaction, I mean, it, all the structures that were everything that you knew as a caterpillar are turning into goo. And no wonder your immune system is fighting that tooth and nail until your immune system gets overwhelmed. But finally, the immune system gets overwhelmed. Most of the structure of the caterpillar turns into goo. And then the transformation happens. That's what meditation feels like to me, which means it's, it's a double-edged kind of thing. It's, it's both extremely painful because everything that I know and have been connected to and addicted to is dissolving. But on the other hand, I'm realizing, wait, 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 well, that wasn't absolutely that essential. I thought it was essential, but it's not. And there's a new kind of structure that's being built that I have no idea. A caterpillar can't figure out what the butterfly is going to be, presumably. And so maybe that's what it's like to be starting to change headsets. Maybe, that's, maybe meditation is a way of letting go of some of the, the restrictive trappings of one headset and upgrading Right, and you're getting the 3.0 now. You just had the 2.0. Now it's 3.0. I don't know, but but these are the kinds of things I do want to explore within the mathematics, to, and that's why I'm I'm sort of it, it all fits. It doesn't mean it's right, but it all fits. The kid in the candy store, my own kid anticipation of seeing what's next. It it does fit. Maybe that's why I like the kid in the candy store theory. Just that's just me, and you know, for other people, that's that's not what it's about. But I think all of us do wonder about what's next. And why are we here? And what is it about? That's why I'm, I mean, that's one reason I do this is it, it, life is very, very short. I want to explore. And things, that, most of what I've believed very deeply has been very deeply wrong. Most of what humanity has believed very deeply has been very deeply wrong. We have a very good, we're almost about 100% consistent in being deeply wrong. We believed that space time is fundamental. Almost everybody believes that space-time is fundamental. We all believe the Earth is flat. Now a few very advanced physicists 
Ed Witten has said space-time is doomed. David Gross has said it's in doomed. Nima Arkani Hamed is saying space-time is doomed. And these guys, especially Nima, are now really being adventurous, very, very brave, and saying, let's go outside of space and time into a world where we can't think. Just imagine what they're trying to do. We're trying to think entirely outside space and time. Like, as you said, as, as a kid, you're going, what could possibly be on the other side of space and time? Mm. These guys are saying, not only is there something on the other side, I need to think deeply about it, and here's a mathematical structure in which space and time, quantum mechanics and unitarity, don't even appear in the language. And then I'll show you how our headset, they don't call it a headset, that's now me ad-libbing for them. But <clears throat> so how space and time, which I'm calling a headset, how space and time and quantum mechanics and general relativity uh, appear from these deeper structures in which there's no space and no time. So that fits perfectly with what, what I'm saying. Now, they have no idea what this deeper structure is about. And what I'm up to is I'm actually, Nima gave a, a class at Harvard last fall, more than 20 lectures on, for graduate students on these deeper structures outside of space and time. I am taking his class on my own. There's all on YouTube, so I'm just studying it. I'm transcribing his lectures, studying them, because I believe that I can show with my team, I'm mathematicians, so they'll show, that the long-term behavior of this dynamics of consciousness that we're working on, what we call the asymptotic behavior, will give rise to the structures he's seeing, like his amplitude hedron. And so the reason why, and then the amplitude hedron, he already shows how to build up space-time from that. That way I'll be able to go all the way from conscious agents through the long-term behavior of conscious agents, through the amplitude hedron to space-time, I can show you how the headset is built. That's my goal. And so I'm, I'm really quite excited. Once I get, uh, you know, I know enough to be worth his time, I, I may talk with him, but, but I'm not going to waste his time until I know enough. So I'm trying to figure out how the headset is built. Once we, if we succeed, we'll be able to reverse engineer that headset. And the technologies, we'll, we'll be able to play with the parameters of space-time. So it's like, suppose you're you know, a, a wizard at Grand Theft Auto and you can play within the game, mm -hmm. do all sorts of things that people find amazing. That's great. But imagine someone who actually knows the source code. They can take the wizard and they can give him a flat tire. They can take all the gas out of his tank. They can make the road infinitely long. They can do whatever they want to. They can play with the very parameters. Of so the wizard is nothing. All of our science right now has made us wizards. We're eventually going to get the source code of the game. There's literally a book called Off to Be the Wizard about somebody who realizes this is all source code and he can go in and edit the code. Wow. That okay. is, uh, wow. you should check that out. Donald, thank you so much. This has been absolutely thrilling. <laughs> Reading your book, listening to your interviews, and now spending time with you is amazing. I am now going to think of myself as the caterpillar fighting off the butterfly. <laughs> that was amazing. I love that. Uh, you've liquefied my brain, and I hope that on the other <laughs> side is a butterfly, but uh, who knows? Thank you so much for joining us. It was a great pleasure, Tom. Thank you so much. You got it, man. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. That was it. Thank you for joining us. Conversation with Tom. There it is. If you made it this far, you are my hero. Peace out. <laughs> That's going to be the thing that opens up so much, not only in terms of our ability to experience the world, to get out of the narrow you know, viewpoint that we're in and, and be able to open up to other things, um, but it'll also teach us a lot about how the brain constructs qualia and um, how, we, how we have our experiences in the world.